The appointed hour is six o'clock having been reached. I welcome everyone to this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals. My name is Steve Judge. As chair of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals, I call this meeting to order. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 18, and the Governor's March 15th, 2020 order, imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. This public hearing of the Town of Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but the public can listen to the proceedings by clicking on the link in the town's webpage. In accordance with provisions of Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40A and Article 10, special permit granting authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw. This public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. We will begin with a roll call of the regular members of the ZBA. Um, Steve Judge, the chairman is here. Mr. Langsdale? Here. Uh, Ms. O'Meara? <clears throat> Ms. Parks? Here. Mr. Maxfield? Here. And associate ZBA members, Ms. Waldman, Mr. Barrick, Mr. Greeny, and Mr. Meadows. Here. Also attending is Maureen Pollock, planner. Rob Mora, building commissioners, will be attending, and Dave Washevitz, senior building inspector. The zoning board is a quasi judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. One of the most important sections of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw is section 10.38. Specific findings from this section must be made for all of our decisions. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing after which the board will ask questions for clarification or additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public comment. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen. The chair with the assistance of the staff will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, present your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition is heard by the, heard by the board is distinct and is evaluated on its own merits. And the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of the hearing to file a decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of the filing to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed with the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there is a 20 day appeal period for an aggrieved party to contest the decision with relevant judicial body in superior court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the registry of deeds to take effect. The public can view the recording of this meeting in the town's YouTube channel. Tonight, we have the following agenda. Public meeting ZBA FY 2021-13 and Massey for the review and or approval of a de minimis change in the previously approved site plan of the previously approved special permit ZBA FY 2016-23 in order to allow a two and a half foot tall removable Victorian style metal fence to be located on the south side of the building wall associated with the dwelling unit number one located at 32 North Prospect Street, map 14A, parcel 32, General Residence RG Zoning District. We'll have a public hearing on ZBA 2021-03, Pioneer Property Services LLC, request a special permit to convert the existing detached garage to a residential unit 
which will increase the number of residential units converted dwelling from one to two under sections 3.3241, 9.22, and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw. Located at 275 East Pleasant Street, Map 11B, Parcel 63, Neighborhood Residents RN Zoning District. This is continued from January 7th, 2021. We will have a general comment period that follows both of those items, as well as other business that is not anticipated within the last 48 hours. The first order of business tonight is a public meeting on ZBA 2021-13. I have recused myself from this matter as, as I am a neighbor of the property. Mr. Maxfield will serve as acting chair and Mr. Langsdale, Ms. Parks, Mr. Meadows and Mr. Barrick will serve on the panel. Mr. Maxfield, you have the chair. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, who will be uh, presenting for um, the application here? Uh, I believe Anne, Anne Macy is present. Yes. Um, right. And I have made her a panelist. So Anne, if you could turn your microphone on and, and camera, if you have that. Oh, yep, yeah, I see you. Yeah. All okay. right. Uh, and this will be for the board to determine whether or not this is a de minimis change. Uh, if we decide yes, then uh, we will not have to, um, will not require a special permit, and you'll be able to go ahead with this. You can go ahead and just state your name and uh, address for the record. Yeah, it's Ann Massey, 32 North Prospect Street, unit number one in the Lovell House condominiums. Thank you. All right, go ahead whenever you're ready. <laughs> Um, what we, uh, when we purchased the condo uh, last June, uh, we had with Bert Ewert, the developer, um, we had worked with him uh, to ask for permission to put in a small fenced area off of the side porch uh, of the condo building, the main building, the house on uh, the property. And so we've been uh, trying in the middle of the pandemic over the summer and into the fall, trying to uh, secure a vendor, uh, a fence installer that could do something. Uh, we were unsuccessful partially because of the pandemic supply chain problems. Uh, the uh, local uh, four vendors were not particularly interested in the small nature of the project. And I think largely because they were way behind schedule. So in the interim um, in November, we purchased um, a, uh, the, the metal Victorian fence that is a removable, reconfigurable fence that we installed on the side of the property off of that side door for our dog to use to go out. And um, I had spoken with uh, Jennifer Mullins uh, just to check because we had done some other work interior to the property and uh, checked with to see if we needed a permit. And she said that we didn't because it was, um, that we hadn't poured any concrete, that it was not a permanent structure and that was not our intention. And so our intent with the removal of fence is until we can get um, a, a more permanent structure, which we would then get, um, you know, whatever approvals we need, if we need to get a permit, if it's concrete, if we need any, any additional zoning permits, um, we would just use this removable metal uh, uh, Victorian fence. I'm sorry, it's sideways there, but um, uh, in the interim. And then if we are gone for any extended periods of time, as we've shared with our uh, other association members, our intent is just to remove the fence, take it out, because we can take it out um, uh, for mowing purposes so that we would not cause any trouble in the mowing. So, um, Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions from board members? Uh, Maureen, uh, that fence is, is currently up now, correct? Yes, it is. Do we just have any photos of that fence uh, we, available to us? Oh, we do. Um, you know, I might have forgotten to put it in the specific packet. Um, you, you sent me a picture of it, Maureen, which was nice. <laughs> you was did. In, you did. Before you, it was buried in snow. You did send me a photo of it. I can uh, pull it up in my email. I think I, by accident, didn't include it in this. And let me see. If you bear with me for a moment, the luxury of being remote is I have a computer right in front of me. Um, and we don't have to be out in the cold. Exactly. Complain about that. Uh, 
Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Go ahead, Mr. Langsell. Thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Massey, uh, you were talking about this uh, uh, fence that you've put up, the uh, Victorian looking fence, which I don't, looks quite nice to me. And I like the idea that it's, uh, it's movable and it's removable uh, and that you have a corgi style dog. Uh, smart I like, dog, yes. <laughs> I like corgi dogs, they're really smart. Um, my question, I guess, is why would you then want a permanent enclosure? There's, oh, yeah, yeah, there, there it is. Um, the, the intent was that we were going to try to do something comparable, not necessarily exactly like the other uh, wooden uh, picket fences that are in the back building, the, the four units to the back. So right. that was the original intent when we had been working and talking with the builder slash seller uh, a year ago. And so that's what we were trying to get. And we were unsuccessful this, this in 2020, we were unsuccessful to do that. But why would you want to go forward sometime in the future with uh, something that's um, much more substantial than this. I mean, that for a corgi, I mean, this seems to me to be a, a perfect yeah. solution. Um, and and and, and that, that was a question that um, we have um, for the board is, and this is why we came forward with it. You know, I, I'd spoken with Jennifer Mullins about the permit, but also trying to understand, you know, we're new to Amherst, trying to understand the zoning rules and regulations and whether this fence is something that we could continue to use. As I said, we would take it down when we're not here for extended periods of time for mowing purposes, not to interfere with that. And so that is a question, is, is, this, a, is this something that we could use when we are here or um, should we apply for a more uh, permanent structure? And that was part of, the, part of my question when I had approached Chris um, and the, the zoning office uh, in December. Well, I think if you'd want to apply for a, uh, a more permanent structure, uh, that would probably require a special permit. But I think okay. for this fence here, uh, the one we're looking at today, um, from, from what I've seen in the uh, presentation and the, the information we've received, uh, I do not think um, or rather, I do think this is a de minimis change, uh, and unless uh, any other board members have any questions for the applicant here, uh, I would entertain a motion that we find this to be a de minimis, minimis change. Do I have a motion? So, so moved. Do, you, do I have a second? Excellent. Any other questions from board members? Yes. Uh, Langsdale. <clears throat> so if, if we approve this de minimis change at, for this fence and they come back later and want to get a special permit for a more uh, permanent kind of fence, does this, does this, uh, does our approval of this fence um, influence the the approval of something more permanent i guess in the future uh, my understanding to that is no um this is essentially if someone were to come to us asking if they were putting uh lawn chairs out on their line lawn is that a de minimis change we would, would certainly say yes we don't need to uh grant you a special permit for something like that and i i think that's essentially what we're asking here of this change specifically is this de minimis or is this something that the board actually needs to um, issue a special permit for is, is what this motion is. If they do want to come back to us with something that would require a special permit, they'd have to apply for a special permit. And uh, this application here or this um, essentially question to the board, does this require a special permit for what they've done here would have no bearing on that. That's very helpful, thank you. <clears throat> All right. Any other questions? If not, then we will go ahead and move to a roll call vote. Uh, chair votes aye. Uh, Mr. Langsdale? Aye. Uh, Mr. Barrick? Aye. Mrs. Parks? Aye. And Ms. O'Meara? 
we don't have Ms. Amir, I'm sorry, is it uh, Mr. Meadows who's sitting in, correct? Yes, okay. that's correct. Hi. Meadows. Hi. All right, we uh, find that this is a de minimis change and does not require a special permit from the ZBA. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Maureen, for your help. All right, All right. I pass it on back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Maxfield and Mr. Barrick for participating um, as well. Um, the next order of business is a public, a public hearing on ZBA FY 2021-03, Pioneer, Proper, Pioneer Property Services, LLC, requests a special permit to convert the existing detached garage to a residential unit, which will increase the number of residential units converted dwelling from one to two under section 3.3241, 9.22, and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw. Located at 275 East Pleasant Street, Map 11B, Parcel 63, Neighborhood Residence District RN. Continue, this is continued from January 7th, 2021. On this matter, Mr. Meadows will replace Ms. O'Meara on the panel. So are there any disclosures from the board members? First, I want to go through the submissions we have received since our last meeting. We have received from the applicant um, transmittal of supplemental information prepared by the Zengineer dated January 24th, 2021. A plan set prepared by the Zengineer dated 20, January 24th, 2021, which includes a title sheet, existing plans, existing conditions and removals, site plan and details, Updated basement floor plan found on the revised site plan prepared by the Zengineer dated January 24th. Uh, the basement floor plan has been updated. A proposed floor plan found on the revised site plan prepared by the Zengineer dated January 24th, 2021. Uh, no updates to that. Uh, light fixture specification sheets. Um, we also have received since that time staff documents prepared in preparation of the January 28th meeting, project application report dated January 27th, and comments from the town engineer dated January 27th. We have received public comments uh, since that meeting, including one which we had failed, inadvertently failed to note in the public record from Mr. Jeffrey Cobb dated December 14th. We also had comments from Bruce Carlson and Ira Breck dated January 21st and 22nd. Comments from Town Council President Lynn Grismere dated January 22nd, 2021. A legal opinion provided by Attorney Tom Reedy dated January 25th, 2021. And comments from Ms. Mr. Richard Rosnoy dated January 27th, 2021. Um, there are some updates to the to the site plan, which we talked about. I don't think those have to be read into the record again, do they, Maureen? We've already referenced those already. And yes, if you reference them. Yep. Um, yep, that's fine. They're all referenced already. So um, when we adjourned the last meeting, we were in the middle of receiving public comments on the application. Um, and I wanna continue hearing from the public first. I understand that some neighbors have hired Mr. Reedy to represent them, and he has submitted a written document regarding this matter. So I'd like to hear from the neighbors first, and then ask Mr. Reedy to sub summarize his submission. We've, we've received it. I'm assuming we've all read it. So a summary of it was, is all that's really needed. And after the public comment, the applicant or his representative has a chance to respond to the public comments. So Mr. Sparkle, you have submitted minor changes to your earlier uh, submissions. And I would like to ask you to describe them during your response to the public comments, that period after the public comment, all right? Yeah. And then board members will have a chance to ask additional questions of the applicant. And then we will determine whether we're ready to move to a public meeting for the board to discuss and consider the application, the findings we have to make under various provisions of the bylaw and any conditions to the special permit. Are board members clear about this process we're gonna to use tonight and are there any questions on the process? Okay, so yeah, we uh, first go, go ahead, Mr. Uh, Lyon. Uh, yep. Mr. Chairman. Yep. Um, I, I don't seem to have, I know I haven't read 
and I don't seem to have, I was just trying to go through my emails. Mm -hmm. I don't have a, a statement or a, I mean, a, a, from anything from Mr. Reedy regarding this uh, application. So I would like to have, whenever it's uh, necessary, I would like to have that uh, written, uh, read into the record so that I have a chance to, to hear and know what it, what it says. So, you, so um, Keith, Mr. Langsdale, you have to, you can find it on um, the OneDrive that Maureen, the email that Maureen sent us, which has a OneDrive link. And Maureen, maybe you could send him that link. It's a, sure. it's a six page document, Mr. Langsdale. I don't know that we want to read that six pages into it. Um, but I don't want you to be operating without that information. So, um, yeah, I mean, now, you know, yeah. I mean, you can send it to me, but I can't read it while everything is going on. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And maybe that we're, we are I mean, not. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Again, we come back to, we get information the day of or the day before. Uh, I don't know when Reedy sent this, but we've got other information again today and yesterday what i'm what I'm i don't understand what's what's the problem with getting information early we talked about this trying to making sure that we got every in, in all information a week before so that we had time to read it and digest it i mean just i think you're you're raising sorry, a good I'm very, point I'm, I I'm very frustrated by this this continues this continues to go on with this with this board and i don't know why so i think this came in on what's the date that this was received was it monday uh, yes i believe it came in on monday and i i believe i emailed it to each of the zba members uh perhaps i uh mistakenly didn't include keith in the email so i apologize for that if that if that is the case but i i, I believe i emailed it immediately after uh, Mr. Reedy had sent it in around three o'clock on Monday. And ideally, Keith, you're, Mr. Langsdale, you're right. We wanted to have this in seven days ahead of time um, so that we could review it. It did come in four days ahead of time, which isn't as good as, it, as we would like. Um, but I think there, I, I, I reviewed it, I think on Monday. But but I it, but it, this is not just about what Mr. Reedy sent, and he sent it on Monday. Fine, it, it's we have discussed this in times past, in months past, about getting information a week before the uh, the meeting, so that we have time to read it, digest it, ask questions, go over it, and, and understand it, rather than having it thrown at us. Mm -hmm. during the meeting or, or, you know, hours before the meeting. This continues to go on. And I don't understand why we continue to, to uh, uh, deal with this and, and not just say, okay, we're gonna continue it because we didn't get the information. We'll continue it so we have time to look at it. And if you have any more information to send to us, you sent it to us a week before the, the meeting. I mean, that's what we had agreed on from my understanding in months past, and it continues to go on. I don't understand. You know, I, I think you raise a great point. Um, I guess my, my opinion was that there was enough time to read the, the new information, which was four days, uh, to read the information. That's but, Mr. Reedy's, uh, yeah, but we got other information today and yesterday. And some of that was public comment. What was, what did we receive today? Was it oh. significant change to the to the um, I don't think to the site plan? Was there significant? Uh, no, we didn't. Received, uh, it, actually, we haven't received anything from the applicant. Um, you know, um, per, uh, I've been uh, receiving public comments that um, you know a few per day, and I've been forwarding those along as they come in. Um, but I think the other. And, oh no, I did. Sorry, I did receive uh, submittals from the applicant, and those were submitted, I believe, last. I believe they were also submitted on Monday. 
if, if memory serves me or last Friday, I can't recall. So yeah, you know, um, it's, so, it's something that I think we all could do better on and, and being uh, more consistent. Um, so, you know, the board, the board can do uh, the best it can tonight. And uh, for things that you need more time on, um, you can continue mm -hmm. it to the next meeting. But for items that you feel that you have, you know, prepared for in preparation of this meeting, you can certainly review and have a discussion uh, and take public comments. So um, th there's no rush. And that's um, one of the reasons that I've said we want to have a discussion about whether we're prepared to move on to the public meeting portion of this before we actually close the hearing and move on. I'm, you know, Mr. Langsdale, if you're not prepared to move to a decision yet because you need more time and I, you need more time to review this, that's perfectly fine. That's a re reasonable position for you to take. And I'm not sure that you wouldn't have some support amongst other board members for that. So uh, there is no reason that we have to do this, to make this decision tonight, but we can still talk about a lot of the things. And if there's more that, you need, if there's more information that you need uh, to, to digest before you can give an, uh, make a decision and you need to talk to either look at the site plans or the, or the public comments or the, the uh, memo by Mr. Reedy, those can be dealt with again in the next time we hold the meeting, uh, if we continue the meeting to a later date. All right, thank you. Yep. What, what I have here in front of me is um, today, uh, from Maureen, attached you will find an updated project application report dated January 28, 2021 for 275 East Pleasant Street. Um, I've highlighted the yellow areas that are, and there are three different, two PDFs. And I mean, this is all information that came in today uh, at 2.50 PM. Okay, so here's, let's do this, Mr. Langsdale. I, I'm, I was the one that moved the, pushed the seven days for, um, to insert the seven day requ uh, information requirement in our bylaws. And I really feel strongly about this. I'm sure, I think in the case of the project application report, that's an update of, a lot, it really is an update of the earlier project application report. And we, that has got to come in pretty close to the meeting time. But what I'd like to do is, have this discussion about the process and the rules and what we do with, with information in an administrative meeting rather than trying to settle it tonight. I think that's a legitimate, legitimate topic on how we ought to work on um, our process, our procedure, and what we require of applicants and of um, uh, submissions. And I would like to do that during an administrative meeting rather than trying to solve that here on an ad hoc basis. And I would be open to having that in the next meeting. Um, so I'm not postponing it, but I think it's a legitimate topic to discuss. And we, I'd have it, we could have it at the next DBA meeting, which would be in, I, I don't know, in two weeks, is it, Maureen? Yes. Okay. You could schedule it at that time. So what I'd like to do is continue on with the public comment, response from the applicant to the public comment, any questions from the board? And if we feel we're not ready to make a decision tonight, we need more information, we need to consider it longer. We will continue this, we will continue the hearing, the public hearing until a later point in time. But we can still continue, we can, we can still gather public comment and gather um, information uh, at this meeting. So I think those for the attendees who are, um, are there any other questions regarding process? Okay, let's go forward with public comment. Maureen, do we have people who are? Uh, yes. Have raised uh, their hand. Yes. One moment. Let's see here. Uh, we have uh, Miss La uh, Taryn La Raya. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Just bear with me. And if we could keep people to comments of between three and four minutes, and to the extent that um, your information or your position has already been stated by earlier speakers, there's no need to repeat it um, and go into great detail, but uh, please give us your name, your address for the record. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. My name is Taryn LaRaja. I live at 7 Strong Street. 
Um, I want to start by thanking the board for listening to the neighbors' many, many concerns about this project. Um, we are all in agreement that this project would be extremely detrimental to our neighborhood. Um, so many have already written and spoken about how, but I'd like to add a few more thoughts. While the address of the proposed addition is on East Pleasant, the building the applicant wishes to convert is completely on Strong Street. There's one rental on the part of Strong Street between East Pleasant and Wildwood School, um, but the landlord of that property, which is next to Amherst Ballet, has um, been committed to renting to families. Um, it's not an accurate, it's not accurate to represent the other homes that have been mentioned as two families. And Bruce Carson um, very clearly pointed this out in his letter to the board. Um, I'm not sure if any of you have seen Five Wildwood Lane, which is one of the homes they're using as a comparison, but that property is like an architectural gem with several connected buildings that overlook the pond behind the home on the cemetery. That house, which you might expect to see on the cover of say Dwell Magazine or Architectural Digest, Digest is nothing like what is being proposed here. And that's used as kind of comparison um, home. So I, I wanna just say, let's not make that, those as if they're equals. Um, as Ray LaRaja described at the last meeting, um, we're a close knit neighborhood of mostly long-term residents. We don't have anything against students. Um, my husband's a professor, we live across from campus. And um, you know, while we're disappointed, we understand that the existing house is being rented to students. Um, even though the applicants said they were planning to use it as an Airbnb, and they were gonna turn the garage in the backyard um, as use that for a summer camp and after school pr program for children, um, you know, they changed their mind. Okay, um, that's fine. However, adding an additional unit, which is very likely to house more students would really begin to encroach on the feel of this neighborhood. There's no reason to cram more students into the small lot. And um, to correct an earlier comment made at the last session, um, both the abutting properties are conforming in size. Seven Strong Street is a half an acre and 265 East Pleasant is actually a three quarters of an acre. Um, I also wanna just say that I introduced myself to the tenants when one of them pulled into the driveway a few weeks ago. Um, and it was then that I learned that there were actually four tenants in the house. In, in addition to visiting partners and guests, there was a boyfriend there who was with them at the time. Um, the applicant has many times presented to this board that there were three people living in the current house. Um, in fact, the question was proposed at this last hearing and he didn't answer. Um, but at other meetings has said that there are three in the current house and that he wished to add three more in the garage for a total of six residents. Well, <laughs> there are at least four people living in the house now, not three. Um, and I'm just wondering how we're supposed to believe that he'll only rent to the number of people he's telling us. Um, so there are four there now, and now he's changing it to want two more in the new house. So we're still at six. And, um, you know, we know with boyfriends and girlfriends, um, it just feels like there's going to be way too many people for that tiny lot. And, um, you know, what about the many visitors the students have on the weekends? Uh, my understanding is that this that this can expand to up to more than a dozen, even 16 people, which somehow was raised at the last meeting. Um, another thing I wanted to bring up, the applicant has apologized to me several times over the past year about the large brush pile that is right up against our property. And he told me he'd move it. It's still there. Okay, promises made, promises kept. Um, Promises not kept, I should say. Um, what does this mean for the future when there are problems on the property? Even if he has good intentions, will he follow through? Where does this fall on his priorities during a busy week? Um, I wanna thank Mr. Langsdale, I hope he's still here, um, for bringing up using the garage for parking. Um, if safety is such a big concern of everyone here, I just am wondering like, why has the applicant not had the cars be parked in the driveway all fall and winter and the storage put in the empty basement. Um, it just seems to me that there's, there's like this right to have three or more cars parked on the property. And I I just don't understand. I've never understood that to be the case in Amherst. Um, 
And since when is paving over backyards part of a plan to make Amherst a desirable town? Um, let's not kid ourselves here. Um, the way to make parking safe and preserve a yard and garden on this lot is to make tenants park two cars in the existing garage. Uh, the parking, the noise, the lights, the runoff, the safety of students walking to Wildwood. I've mentioned these at other meetings and in letters I've sent to all of you. This is not the right site for this project. If the applicant thinks they could earn more money with an additional bedroom or bathroom added to the existing house, I would be in favor of that. But otherwise, I urge you to require the owners to leave the garage for parking and or a workshop the backyard for grass or a garden, and to help preserve the character of the neighborhood I love so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ms. LaRaja. I think um, um, Mr. Hot, Hotling Cohen. Wait one second. Um, yes. Okay, Jonathan, you'll be able to talk in just a moment. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, thank you. Um, my name is Jonathan Holting Cohen. I live at 259 East Pleasant Street and I'm a relatively new homeowner here. I moved here in 2016 and most of the houses here at that time were uh, owner occupied or single occupied. And I've noticed a trend over the last few years of this changing. Um, the house to the south of me um, also has has changed recently um, to a student rental. And uh, while those, um, the owners of that student rental live in Amherst, um, we end up actually, my partner and I end up being the de facto landlords for these students. We have their phone numbers, we communicate about all the parties that they ever have. And we communicate about the trash that ends up in our yard. And we end up, uh, we actually were, had so much trouble sleeping that we actually had to change the location of our bedroom. And this is just one example of the kinds of changes that I'm seeing in this area. And when I look at this particular change uh, to the corner property, which is a beautiful property and very attractive to new homeowners um, and to people in my pay bracket, um, you know, I would I would say that the, uh, the, the likelihood of uh, increased density uh, would cause a lot of problems for us. Um, we know that the sound travels here. We know that there's uh, all the reasons that have been stated previously um, are not good. And also the, the change in, in the character of the neighborhood, I think would, would, would certainly be detrimental. Um, so, you know, this is a community. I know all the people that live around here. Um, there's also a characterization that the neighborhood starts in Strong Street and it doesn't, it includes East Pleasant. Um, and sure, it's next to campus, but that's why I live here. <laughs> that works really well for me and in and, and my place of work. Um, and it's a great place to live, but I don't wanna see this kind of change. And the other thing I'd like to say is that I don't see this as a mixed housing issue. I don't see this as a mixed income. I'm all for uh, mixed income housing. I'm all for students living around. Um, but I do not see this in that light. I think that would be a very different project. Um, I also think that the changes that have been made in the upgrades to the house have been quite minimal. Um, the painting isn't finished. There are no gutters on the house. There's no, um, the painting doesn't look like it's been sanded. The windows haven't been updated. Maybe these are long-term plans, but it just doesn't feel like a responsible and ethical investment in this neighborhood that I have invested in. Um, because this is a place I'd like to live for a long time. Sure, you know, maybe I have an entry level house or something like that, but these houses are important uh, for the housing stock. And I would like to see this neighborhood continue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Halton Cohen. Um, Maureen, uh, I guess it's Mr. Uh, Richard Rosnoy. Yep, we'll let him talk. Um. Hi, um, I, Richard and I are sharing a, a site here. So this is Susan Rosnoy. I live at 11 Strong Street. And um, I just feel like the more we learn about this special re request, the more I believe the neighborhood will be significantly damaged if it is approved. Not only will it be detrimental to the area of Amherst in which I live, but the entire town could be affected because there'll be nothing to stop every property owner 
who owns a garage with turning it into an easy money-making structure. Approval will set a precedent that future ZBA boards will have to deal with. We have learned of many documented reasons for rejection. Stormwater problems, lot size, lack of owner, occupancy, parking issues, pedestrian hazards, insufficient setbacks, and yet the owner continues to ask for substantial relief from a long list of requirements, one of which is two dwellings on a 16,000 square foot lot when the required minimum is 26,000 square feet. That's 61% of what zoning laws demand. And in a RN zone, the requirement is 20 feet for the front yard setback, but this is 15 too close according to what he currently owns. These are just two examples of special requests. I'm also becoming more concerned that this neighborhood is reaching the 50% tipping point when there are more rentals than owner occupied dwellings. In the past 25 years of living on Strong Street, I've witnessed an increasing number of college age students walking to UMass for their classes and many more loud parties. So the change in ownership is increasing. The ZBA application FY 2021-03 should be denied because it will be extremely detrimental to the existing neighborhood and could open a Pandora's box situation for the entire town. The ZBA has discretion to deny this spot zoning request by carefully considering its impact on all neighborhoods in, all neighborhoods in Amherst. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Uh, next we have Ray La Raya. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Ray LaRage. I'm going to butter on seven strong. So at the last meeting, I talked about how the neighborhood is changing. Um, you know, as we're all saying, we understand students need places to live off campus. And we have more than our fair share right now. And this project is, as my neighbor Sue was pointing out, it, it's a tipping point of overburdening and changing the family character of this neighborhood. Uh, project obviously designed to squeeze in many students. So my concern today actually is, is about how this property use is gonna affect me directly as an immediate abutter. Tara and I have lived here almost two decades raising our family. And this project proposes a huge increase in the impervious area, taking up a significant portion of a small lot. Uh, right now it's all grass back there. And it's a mystery to me why a, the project mentions a gravel driveway. There's nothing like it on the property. I don't know how a project can propose such a radical increase in an impervious surface without at least providing a reliable stormwater report. What kind of chemicals, including oil, dirt, runoff from cars are gonna be going into the ground, seeping into adjacent properties. And then there's the lighting. Uh, knowing full well, as other people have attested, the unreliability of the property management so far, I can't simply accept on goodwill that lighting will be implemented well. I expect floodlights to face my property with plenty of glare reflecting off the driveway or the snow or whatever, right into my bedroom and working study. And the proposed screening seems entirely inadequate, especially at the height of these lights going on from dusk to dawn. So, so um, you know, by adding this conversion to more students, the project minimally doubles the nuisances of noise, light and traffic, and probably more because of its prime location for student visitors from campus. Weekends will be packed. We've already seen it this year. Um, and we as neighbors, as Jonathan pointed out, are gonna be the de facto managers and enforcers. So, you know, I, let me just conclude by saying, I'm still puzzled how this project gets off the ground. It's, it's these kind of exemptions were not the intent of the 1986 planning board report. Uh, this is real policy drift over time. The rental developers, they're pushing into family neighborhoods in ways unintended by that original purpose. And the exemptions, you know, for projects that increase density, great and help neighborhoods, that's common sense. But waivers that fundamentally impact the butters like myself and transform the neighborhood and open, as Sue said, a Pandora's box to bad conversions is hazardous, not just to this neighbor, but the entire town. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks for your voluntary service on this committee.
Thank you, Mr. Lavaja. Uh, next. Who's next, Maureen? Mm -hmm. uh, Bruce Carlson. Hello, this is Bruce Carson. Hi, Bruce. Hi, uh, I'm at number eight Strong Street. I'd, I'd like to just reiterate what my neighbors have said and also point out that in the examples that were cited in the last meeting as being two family houses in the area, that those are really in-law apartments that are built within single family homes. They're not detached dwellings. And that in over almost 30 years of living in this neighborhood, my experience has been that those units are usually one person because it's just one bedroom. Um, the owner is in the same house or at the, at the most it's a married couple because again, it's, they're just one bedroom. They're uh, either studios or one bedroom. Uh, they're, they're not stu student houses in the sense that the house next to me is, which is also on East Pleasant Street. That has four unrelated, but most of the others are just one person or two people in an apartment. So thank you all for your service. Thank you, Mr. Carson. Uh, next we have, uh, I see a hand, oh, uh, David Boss. Hello. Hi, David. Hi, um, so my name is David Bossi. I live at 20 Strong Street. Um, my wife and I have lived here for about 25 years and we, we have seen the neighborhood change uh, somewhat during that time. Um, I just wanna echo things that have previously been said about uh, a new precedent being set here, composition of the neighborhood, which is of concern to uh, to us and just wanted to speak for a moment about traffic. Um, our driveway is more than 500 feet from the corner of East Pleasant and Strong Street. And in pre-COVID times, cars would be backed up as far as our driveway, eastbound, uh, west, I'm sorry, westbound cars would be backed up as far as our driveway. So. There's already an issue with, with traffic, and I, I think it's only reasonable to expect that if this, um, the garage is uh, converted, there will be more cars parked there than um, we have been told are, will be accommodated on, on the, um, the paving. So uh, there's, because of the way, um, uh, Clark Hill Road and East Pleasant intersect. There's just a, a lot of uh, traffic issues. And uh, as I said, in 25 years, we've uh, witnessed or have seen the, um, the results of numerous fender benders that have occurred around the intersection. So adding more cars right at the intersection, I, I can't believe is, uh, makes any sense. And uh, we, we oppose uh, the, the garage conversion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bossy. Um, uh, next is uh, someone calling from their telephone. Uh, let me allow you to talk. Let's see here. If you could state your name and your address. Um, uh, asking you to, to unmute yourself. Let's see here. Um, remove from, hmm, I'm, I'm pressing um, the button to allow you to speak. So bear with us for a moment. Um, ask to unmute. Hmm. I, I believe if you press star six, that might help unmute you. Okay, it worked. Hello? Hi, this is uh, Jeff Cobb from 6 Wildwood Lane. How are you? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, yes we yep. can, Mr. Okay, Cobb. great, yeah. Hi, uh, so actually I've spoken before and I've sent um, written comments, so I won't, uh, I, I don't, I won't take a lot of your time. I just wanted to just uh, make one, one other comment, which it, it may be obvious to the, to the board members, but the, we just have 
in this town now, I go, I grew up in Amherst. I was raised on, on down on high street and that, you know, been here 50 years. And, um, there's just so many options now for renters, not students, not just students, but renters. We have new dormitories for, for students that are going up on Olympia drive. We have another one that's coming up. We have all sorts. We have at least a dozen apartment complexes. We have many different options, co-housing. We have uh, traditional uh, kind of old, well, you, you, I think you all know, you know all this. There's just so many options for, for students. And, I see this trend walking around town on the, on the fringe neighborhoods, you know, Butterfield Terrace and Faring Street and where the single family homes are being taken and converted into uh, rentals, mostly for students, but some, some not, but it's just not needed. There, there's no need to take single family homes off the market for an already rich, rich, it's very rich marketplace for renters in Amherst. And, what concerns me is taking these single family homes off the market actually hurts the affordability of housing in Amherst because families and people who want to be single family <laughs> homeowners, they can't get these small homes or these homes that are not as expensive as Amherst Woods or Echo Hill. They can't get that because they're taken by investors who then think they can convert them or turn them into uh, basically uh, uh, rentals for uh, profit. And what we've seen, what I've seen over the over time, having been raised here, is these peripheral neighborhoods along the university. Uh, you know, Butterfield Terrace, this one time was all single-family homes. My father considered buying a house there at one time. It's now completely changed. You know, Faring and Sunset Avenue, they're just holding the line. And you can see it creep up East Pleasant, and you get the same sense if you're on North Pleasant, when you, if you're anywhere familiar with that area as well. Anyway, I guess I'm worried and concerned that we're considering taking a single family home off the market to allow a non-resident business person to rent it out to as many people as possible when there's no need. There's just, there's just so many options that, that renters have that there's no need for an additional rental in Amherst. Uh, thank, that's, that's my comment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Cobb. Um, let's see here. Uh, next, we have Richard Ronzoy. Um, Richard, you should be able to talk. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, I didn't see the, uh, the pop-up. This is Richard Rosnoy at 11 Strong Street. Um, we are the next neighbor past the Larages, so we're within the 300-foot um, uh, boundary of the application property. Uh, I recently I recently sent in a, a memo, which I hope you'll find as brief. I uh, made uh, six uh, brief, but I hope you'll find salient points uh, about this, so I won't uh, take too much of your time. But I, I wanted to uh, uh, just point out uh, this is the, the scope of this application in relation to the one-time exception that's allowed under the 1986 bylaw amendment is just so far off of what was ever envisioned as being used for the one-time exception um, that uh, if you grant this application, if you grant a permit here, you will have a hard time ever uh, coming up with a reason not to use that one-time exception. Um, uh, I think there's been lots of language that you've seen, so I won't go through it, um, you know, from uh, our attorney, attorney Tom Reedy, Reedy and uh, from others. And uh, town attorney, Mr. Bard has, uh, has said, yes, it's within your purview to uh, accept the application under that exception. Uh, and that's fair enough. But then if you go to the next step and say, well, using this application, uh, under that one-time exception is acceptable to you, uh, think of what will happen following that. Uh, I also want to say that uh, our attorney, uh, he represents us also, Susan and me, uh, attorney Reedy has submitted a, uh, I think, rather comprehensive uh, re uh, explanation of why this should never be uh, approved, why it should be uh, not accepted and denied. And I hope that you all have had a chance to read that and review it. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, also, when we started this, a couple of public 
hearing sessions ago, uh, there were thoughts that, well, maybe there were some ways that the applicant could modify the application and, or you could put some conditions on, on a permit. But as we get further and further into this, it just becomes more and more clear that uh, everybody here in the neighborhood, and certainly I believe that only a denial really is uh, possible here to satisfy the requirements that are needed to grant a special permit. As you know, the burden on granting a special permit is high. It's a, a heavy burden on the applicant. Every condition required for a special permit must be met by the applicant and hardly any are met here. Uh, I've uh, made, I put some language in the memo that I submitted about uh, what's necessary in this regard. So I hope you'll review that and I won't take any more of your time. Thank you very much uh, for all you do. Thank you, Mr. Rosman. Um, no one else has indicated that they'd like to speak. Oh, someone has, hold on. Yep. Uh, Carrie Strayer. Um, yes, yeah, Carrie Strayer, 226 East Pleasant. Sorry, I, I thought I had raised my hand earlier. I guess it didn't, uh, didn't pop up. Uh, I'm a little further down the street than uh, most of the people who have spoken today, but I have the same concerns that they have. Um, I spoke at the last uh, meeting of, of the ZBA, and I don't want to uh, repeat my comments because I'm already on, on record for that, but this is just a bad project in, in the wrong place. Um, if, it, if it's approved, it's gonna change the character of the neighborhood and you're gonna have other landlords who are gonna be encouraged to try to do the exact same thing. And we're gonna have a whole line of houses up and down East Pleasant and, and on Strong Street, uh, full of landlords trying to put you know, two housing units on, on their properties. It's, it's not a good thing. And I, I'd request the board to uh, reject this application. And I also thank you for your service. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Strayer. Um, anyone else? Um, no one. Uh, no one's raising their hand virtually. So the one I see nobody. The one thing we were going to do is have a summary of Attorney Reedy's memo, um, knowing that. Not all members of the board have had a chance to read it and digest it, and we may need more time than what's afforded to us tonight. But I would ask, I intended to have Mr. Reedy summarize um, as best he can the memo that he submitted in support of, uh, I mean, for the uh, for his clients who are the neighbors um, um, to this project application. So, Mr. Reedy, can you? Give us a summary of that um, memo. I'd be happy to, Mr. Chair. Uh, and for the record, good evening. Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson out of Amherst, here on behalf of uh, the neighbors in opposition to the granting of this special permit. Um, as they say in the law, the document speaks for itself. So I, I would suggest or commend all board members to take a look. It, it's nine pages. Uh, I got it in on, on Monday afternoon, which was the deadline given to me by the town. Um, and so I, I think it's worth a read. Essentially, what, what we've done is laid out the genesis and intent of that 1986 uh, zoning bylaw amendment. And I think as you've heard from my clients, um, the original intent was, you know, for those larger homes in town that they're just a few feet shy of frontage or setback requirements. And I think, you know, it's pretty evident that this does not fit into that uh, intended purpose. And then we've just brought up some issues relative to uh, potential mischaracterizations of not only the neighborhood, you know, those, I think as Mr. Carson suggested, those two family homes that were referenced previously are actually more in the lines of like a supplemental dwelling or an in-law apartment, because what we had also done was attached um, the decisions for both of those. And they were both for apartments in the basement of an existing single family home. So again, differing from here where you've got a totally separate structure. Also on the, um, the, the plans, you see Mr. Iser's, Randy Iser, the, the surveyor's plans have uh, existing conditions that don't match up with um, Mr. Sparkle's existing conditions relative to the gravel driveway. 
and also what the proposed coverage will be. You know, Mr. Iser's plan, just his proposed plan is different than what you have from Mr. Sparkle. And so some of the basis of comments relative to the impact of stormwater, where you have Mr. Sparkle saying, well, there's 4,000 some odd square feet of already existing you know, impervious surface and we're only adding a, a small amount that's gonna have a minor impact. When you look at Mr. Iser's plan, there's much less you know, impervious surface. And so we would, we would assume that there's much greater impact. And so, you know, given a, a, a project like this, even though single family, two family homes aren't uh, required to comply with the Massachusetts stormwater standards for the findings that uh, the applicant is looking for, because we do believe that it would be more uh, detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing um, use. You know, a stormwater report seems to make some sense as would a photometric plan, because I think as you heard Mr. LaRaja suggest, you know, when I start to look at the plan and I look at the parking lot and I wonder how high the light, the floodlight, dark sky compliant or not, the floodlight is going to be um, so that I can cover the entire parking lot and it's going to face directly at the LaRaja's home. You know, even a photometric plan is not going to, even if it shows that the foot candles diminish by the property line, um, it is still going to have a, a negative effect on the abutters. And so besides those few things, you know, you look at the neighborhood and you've got 92% of the neighborhood in, in the thousand foot radius or single family homes, 79% of them are owner occupied. And here really what they're looking to do is to put two single family homes on, you know, each 8,000 square feet. You've got 16,000 square feet total, and they're looking to put two single family homes on them. So not in concert with the neighborhood. And so then what we've done is we've just gone through 9.22, which is the, which are the necessary findings that the board needs to make in these circumstances. And I would agree with attorney Bard, you know, the, the door is open, um, but the board does not have to allow the applicant to, to walk through. And what I mean is it looks like, you know, condition two and condition eight of uh, the converted dwelling does allow this to move forward, at least to get to the place of um, discussion with the board. But I think as you'll see in, in the memo, what, what they're looking to do is substantially different in character. So they're changing a garage into a home. And then as far as the property goes, they're changing a single family home in, uh, on a property into two single family homes on the property. And then we also think that um, because of the increased density, because of the increased lighting, uh, increased traffic, uh, increased stormwater, increased impervious surface, that it is going to be more detrimental to the neighborhood. I guess, you know, most summarily put, it's 10 pounds of sugar in a five pound bag, utilizing a, a mechanism that that relief that was never intended to be used for this, never intended to be stretched this far. And so we would suggest that it's different in character, different in effect, and substantially more detrimental in effect on the neighborhood than what you've got there existing. And so, you know, through 9.22 and through 10.38, uh, we would suggest that the board has the authority and should deny this special permit. Thank you, Mr. Reedy. Are there any other public comments? Maureen, yeah. do we have anybody else that you've no. seen? No. Okay. Um, the process, the procedure is now for the applicant to respond to the, um, not only the comments that you heard tonight, but the comments from last week. I think you've already responded to some of those in your submissions and also Mr. Sparkle to just identify the changes or the new information that you sent the committee, sent the board since your last, uh, appearance here uh, on January 7th. Okay. Okay, happily. Thank you for your time. Hello. Uh, my name is Becky Sparkle and I am the applicant representative, Pioneer Property Services. Um, I have been uh, tasked tonight with responding to uh, a fair number of comments. Um, we ran out of time last time. We received uh, two and a half days ago, a nine page letter from attorney Reedy and tonight I am prepared to uh, address those comments, including the comments that we heard this evening, um, the majority of which 
you know, it's repetition of a theme, understandably. So um, what I've done is uh, put together, again, a little presentation because there, there's been a, a large amount of content uh, that I've been required to address. So I'm gonna start my screen share here. And just confirming you can see the cover page here. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So uh, first in regards to what has been submitted new from uh, our side, uh, what I've done is I've updated the proposed plan according to comments received from um, the town engineer's office, the fire department, um, and um, really uh, additional information on the basement. So uh, just to home in on this, so you see that there are really very few changes here. Uh, there's some comments regarding the water corporation connection. There's some comments regarding uh, the sanitary sewer uh, connection. Um, let's see other other points we have. Um, oh. Right, that uh, we've talked about, there was questions about what's really going on in the basement. So the applicant submitted um, an updated plan for um, what, because he's now that there's been so many questions, he's thought more deeply about really how's it going to lay out before it was fairly amorphous. So now uh, he's putting a dividing wall in there. So basically one side, the west side is going to be mechanicals. And then the other side, which will have a, a steel door, is going to be a tenant storage room so that it actually provides additional storage for the residents uh, in the garage. Um, I did update the lighting as well. They'll look very similar to before, but previously, um, I, the, though in effect, all of the submittals were dark sky compliant, I couldn't find the certification. So I went out and found um, virtually identical lighting fixtures that did meet dark sky compliant certification. Uh, so those, those were added uh, into the mix. Um, but uh, there's been no change to the parking. There's been no change to the stormwater management system. There's been no change to the impervious area. Um, so effectively it is, it is the same plan except for some uh, utility details and information in the basement. Um, <clears throat> I also wanna to bring to the table um, in, in light of uh, the preponderance of comments and uh, the substantial information we got from attorney Reedy on Monday, uh, the applicant and I have been putting our heads together and really trying to decide, you know, are there any changes warranted in, in the application or conditions that we would request even be written into a special permit? And, and there are a few. And, I think this is going to make the neighborhood feel and hopefully the board feel an awful lot better um, because while uh, the applicant's intentions have always been a certain way, in the past he was kind of hoping to not have his hands tied just in case the world changes five years from now and all of a sudden he gets stuck. Um, but he decided that really he wants to walk his walk and is willing to tie conditions to the application. So here's, here's the update and how it lays out. Um, we have, uh, I have a column for the original application in October and what we're presenting today. Um, so number of bedrooms originally six um, in unit A was three in unit B was three. So when you see these letters A and B, they refer to the farmhouse as A and B is the garage. Um, the current application is just five bedrooms. So there's been a compromise with the community for uh, less density, so it's uh, reduced by one bedroom. Number of tenants, uh, original application was up to 10. Six could be in unit A with four of them unrelated, up to four of them unrelated, and four could be in unit B, up to four of them unrelated. And this is one of the big changes here. So the, the total headcount that could potentially be in the five bedrooms on the property remains at 10 although it unlikely to be fully maxed out, that's possible. So we're you know, being honest about that. Uh, with the six proposed or still possible in the existing farmhouse and four still possible in the garage, but all of them would be related. So what basically the applicant is saying is that the only occupants of that garage will be a family, period, unless it's a single individual. Um, 
So because yeah, it's hard to call one person a family, uh, although maybe some people would argue with that. So it's just going to be a family in the garage. In terms of guests outside, previously the application was up to 12. Um, it's been reduced to no more than 10. So uh, that's when I say outside. So anywhere on the property, a combination of all, all people on that property. So both properties, both dwellings, uh, no more than 10 people in the yard, on the deck, on the porch, that's the limit, which is less than the previous um, application submittal. Number of vehicles uh, could be previously up to six, three for unit A, three for unit B, uh, with no practical limit on overnight guests. Um, although, you know, there are space limits, but uh, we can get into that a little bit later, later when we talk about gravel. Um, current application has been reduced to four, two for each unit with a very strict limit of four cars on the property, period. Uh, there are only four parking spaces, parking off of the pavement. It's not allowed in Amherst um, and can very easily be added as an additional condition if the town were so inclined. So that has been reduced by two. And then undergraduates. And while many people in the community have stated previously and even this evening that they don't have a problem with students, um, it, it, I, I'm not sure that is, um, is exactly what they mean. Um, so originally it was stated that undergraduates were not desired but permitted. Yes, there are undergraduates now. Uh, that is a strange result of COVID effectively and doing a friend, uh, a favor for a friend of the applicant uh, who had um, student age children. So that's how the current situation occurred. It is not the preferred tenant um, by the applicant, but as a by right use, and helping out people in a pandemic, they, they decided to go against their intentions and, and, and help out community members. Uh, but the current application, um, still undergraduates are not really desired as tenants and any, most landlords are gonna tell you that unless they're willing to charge an awful lot of money and rebuild their buildings every year. Um, but specifically, in addition to the garage being just a family, even if it's just a single individual, there can be no undergraduates in that converted dwelling. So uh, that, that is a strong control and we would be very happy for that to be written as a condition into the permit application. So there's a restriction on the tenancy. Um, and hopefully just removing undergraduates from the equation and creating a family housing condition uh, is going to address a large number of the comments, concerns, and fears of the community. Um, I, I, I would hope so. Um, talk briefly, the resident manager has come up quite often in, in comments. So uh, just to kind of briefly touch upon this, that the person needs to be qualified. They have to have understanding of maintenance. Uh, they have to have favorable employment uh, references. They, they will be compensated. So there, there is going to be a financial benefit to being the designated resident manager. They will receive training specific to the property lease agreements and terms, as well as uh, other conditions of the special permit. And uh, many times people, the comment have, uh, comments from the public have said, well, there's no incentive for a resident manager to do their job, um, but I, I, there is because if they fail to perform their responsibility, their occupancy will be terminated. So that is a significant incentive uh, to be homeless because you didn't do your job that takes you 10 hours a year to do. So there is, is actually massive incentive for that person to toe the line, do the right thing. Uh, and if they're living in the garage, it's gonna be a family and a member, an adult, uh, definitely not an undergraduate. Um, I've heard a lot from the community about uh, even tonight, multiple people have said, well, the density is good. I don't have a problem with density. Um, and, and I'm glad to hear that uh, not everybody feels that way, of course, uh, but just sort of a reminder that there's some statements about, well, we've got plenty of housing around, but that's not true. There is a housing crisis. Uh, many municipalities in the region are facing this. Uh, there are an insufficient number of units. It is driving prices up regionally. Um, and partly this is due to what is, is some have called outdated zoning practices. That they actually have the ability to perpetuate certain racial and economic segregations. So the youth population, minorities, middle income, 
they are driven from town disproportionately due to some of the zoning bylaws um, and many municipalities, and I think Amherst is one of them, are now actively working to address these disparities. Those bylaws are not happening now, so I'm not gonna talk about what might be happening. I'm just saying that the environment, the regulatory environment is, is shifting culturally, um, regionally, and very much in the town of Amherst. Um, and in that shifting, you know, it's, it's important to increase density, to increase the housing stock. So we're trying to do this. Um, we're, we're trying to reduce the uh, expansion of roads, water mains, sewers, as well as the costs that come with longer infrastructure lengths, uh, as well as preserve woodlands, preserve farms, and surrounding the already developed areas of town. And uh, this type of density is very much in line with the master plan. Uh, specifically, the master plan even calls out this very neighborhood for increased density. Um, and I think some of the upcoming bylaw changes are likely to reflect that. So addressing, um, I'm going to try and, and aggregate because I've, I've read more than 40 pages of public comments. So obviously I cannot address each and every comment. So I'm, I'm going to try and group it a little bit here and provide context. Um, as of today, there have been 18 letters. 72% um, of them have come from the three abutting households, basically, number seven, eight, and 11 Strong Street. Um, every time I've been at a meeting, these households have come and spoken off to more than one household member. And, and while they're, you know, they're absolutely fully and encouraged uh, to bring their comments and concerns to the table, and they have changed the applicant's perspective, so we, we thank them for uh, really letting go and, and saying what you, what you need. Um, that way we are able to adapt. Um, but it, it, it is, uh, a lot of this really is coming um, just for a couple direct butters, as you might expect. Um, and there are themes in, in the 18 letters and 40 some pages of documentation plus the verbal comments. Uh, there are perceived problems about the property in its current condition. There are also desires about what they want their community look, to look like and separate from themes, there are also, unfortunately, a fair amount of logical fallacies. And that's actually where I'd like to, to start a little bit here, addressing the comments. Um, there have been several suppositions made, and I'm going to try and move these through these quickly, um, though I've been handed a lot of information to address. So um, comments, almost everybody has said that, that converting this garage to a residence is going to destroy the neighborhood character. Um, there are 69 dwelling units in the neighborhood. Uh, adding one more residence does not alter the character of the neighborhood, going from 69 residents, dwellings to 70 residents. There's, there's not a changing character to do that. Um, it was talking about that attached in-law style dwelling should not be considered as a second dwelling unit. And it's been um, brought to my attention a few times and, and I, I regret saying it. I had used the word, phrase two family in the previous meeting um, when trying to summarize seven pages of graphs and um, visual aids that were put together in the neighborhood report. It's a lot of information to try and uh, uh, reduce down. And, and I did use the word to family. I should have said to dwelling. Um, that would have been uh, technically accurate. Um, but, so I, I regret doing that. But the, either way, the attached status or detached status uh, of a property doesn't alter the number of units that are there. So uh, there, there's not a big, not a major difference. Two units is two units. Um, there's been comments that units in a house are okay, but the units in the garage would be a packed tenement situation. Uh, but the reality is the garage actually has a good deal more living space than the existing farmhouse per bedroom. The garage has 458 square feet of room per bedroom. The farmhouse has 295 square feet of living space per bedroom. Uh, so the, the notion that the, the garage is just gonna be some sort of crammed tenement situation is, is far from the case. It'll be a far more comfortable living situation than the existing house. Uh, there's been a lot of pushback on the resident manager as well, saying they should be a professional position um, that there are no incentives, that there's going to be cronyism undermining any of their responsibilities. Um, and I can talk more about that as well, but um, I will say that there really is not such a thing as a professional resident manager. You don't go off to college and get your resident manager degree. 
The job requires five or 10 hours of effort uh, a year. That is not a full-time job, is not a professional position. It's barely a part-time position or a hobby income. Uh, so to say that they should be have professional credentials as a resident manager is fairly ridiculous. Um, and there's certainly an incentive I mentioned before that they're gonna lose the roof over their heads if they don't do their job. So that's a, a significant incentive there. Um, and they're not going to be an undergraduate sitting around drinking beers with their buddies. Um, so also uh, there's been a lot of talk about owner occupancy and the illusion, unfortunately, that owner occupancy guarantees a well-managed property, good property stewardship. Um, I have, uh, I know for a fact, from my own personal experience, that is not true. And I know I'm sitting with this very board uh, on multiple applications that, that the chair has stated, not, not the current chair, uh, that stated that owner, owner occupancy is, is no guarantee of good stewardship. You need to have a good owner to have good stewardship. Not every owner is great. Uh, so you get, you definitely get problems with owner occupancy. It's, it's no cure-all there. Um, however, the, that chair has said many times that it's the conditions of a special permit that provide the guarantee that, that it's going to be a well-managed property. And that's because if it's not well-managed, they lose their permit. They, they can't continue to occupy that space, which is Again, from an incentive perspective, a significant incentive. This, our, the applicant <clears throat> um, would expand the money to rehabilitate this building. I'm sure that is well into a six figure number. And then if they start having problems and violate the terms of a special condition, they don't get to use that as a, as a dwelling anymore. It's over. So they lost their money, they lost their investment. They can't even park cars in it anymore because now it's a kitchen and living room. So there is a significant incentive for uh, the applicant to do what he says he's going to do, as well as you know, adhere to the terms of the special condition. Um, additional comments talking about um, the current problems on site. And uh, there have been numerous talk uh, discussions about safety and that the uh, intersection is dangerous. There are fender benders. There are elementary school kids walking back there. And it's, they're all right. There, there are some meaningful safety um, liabilities for the current conditions. Uh, reversing cars are unsafe, going across the sidewalk, going into the traffic, um, and uh, as well as having so many cars out there, uh, four to six cars that can be out there at times, we've seen photographs of that, uh, can create a more difficult situation, uh, reducing sight distance. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, if that's a if that's really a problem, and it, and it is, the proposal is a really significant improvement on safety. It's just going to be four vehicles on site that will be strictly controlled, so you won't get this scrum of cars and on the property. And those vehicles in the proposal are going to be away from the sidewalk, and that a sea of asphalt that's in the front is going to be converted to grass and yard. Um, and it, it's going to look a lot better, but more importantly, be, be pretty, be enormously safer. Uh, abutters have also talked about uh, flooding and drainage issues in the neighborhood in the letters that they've written. One saying that they've been battling wet basements since 1995 is 25 years of battling flooding in your basement. Um, and that is the property immediately downstream uh, to, I think it's 65, East Pleasant, one of the La Raja properties. And we're proposing a stormwater management system and I can go into that more, but it will make an enormous improvement um, to the runoff on that property. Um, and the community in their letters and comments have also expressed certain desires that they want for, for their neighborhood. They want reasonably priced homes what's being offered is a mid-price rental unit. It's not an affordable housing. Affordable housing is something that the government gets involved in uh, almost every single time or as part of a, a very large development where somebody is forced to take a small portion of the overall. But when you're doing uh, one unit or a small development, you know, even five or six units, uh, you, you can't make any of those affordable housing <clears throat> from a governmental standpoint. So what we're looking for is 
is mid price in the rental market. That's what's being uh, proposed. There are <clears throat> several concerns about the aesthetics that this property is the gateway to the community uh, and to the neighborhood. Somebody said there's been 30 years of neglect uh, to that, to this very property. Um, what is being proposed with the special permit application are new roofs, um, repairs and to the siding, staining the siding, putting up nice clean white trim, updating the lights, which now glare out into the community uh, and removing excess pavement in the front yard. So the aesthetics are going to be significantly improved and that's a desire of the community. Um, as I, I'd already mentioned that community members are already saying, hey, density is a good idea. It's good for the environment. It's good for transportation. It's good for business. It's good for the public in general. This is written in the letters that have been submitted. Um, and we're moving with that too. We're trying to add another unit in the area uh, to, as well as decreasing sprawl and the attendant problems with that. And then people said they want family housing and we're listening to this opportunities for that. So it, the garage, the new, the new dwelling will be for families or an individual professional, no undergraduates allowed. So that is my summary of the, the general public comments. And, and then I have um, uh, the attorney Reedy's letter to, to work with here. And um, for those- So who, Mr. Sparkle, Mr. Yeah. Sparkle, I mean, you have, it looks like you're about a third of the way through your presentation. If I look at the- That's not the quite number. true. That just because <laughs> I, I- I'm just looking I, at the bar here. I don't, I, I don't know how much you got. So. I, I, I do have more, but attached to the back end of this presentation is my presentation from last time. I, I always leave that on because if people want to see stuff that was before details or other information, I have all of that at the ready. Um, I'm not, uh, I'm not going to have, have my, I don't even know, it says 45. It's not that yeah. many. Uh, I'm, okay, I'm at least halfway through here, but um, I, I, considering the, I, think, the, I mean, I think you need to, you need to respond to, uh, to Mr. Reedy's. Uh, memo. So I you should go ahead and do that. I, I, but, um, I think I'll be able to respond to it in less time it took to read it. Okay, but let's yeah, we're at, um, you know, about 20 some minutes right now. So Okay, here okay. we go then. Um, so just to move, I'm going to parallel uh, Attorney Reedy's letter. He starts with a section called original intent of bylaw. Uh, according to our attorney representation, uh, the advice is if the bylaw is clear, it's inappropriate to consider legislative intent. I'm also going to ask the question that um, if anytime somebody challenges a bylaw and says we need to look at the, the legislative intent, is that actually going to be on the table for each and every potential dispute over the meaning or intention behind rules that are already clear? Uh, I can't imagine the public process if, if that is going to be the case. Uh, also, if the intention uh, back then was truly different. The bylaw could have been different. Table three modifications could have had limiting qualifiers, objective qualifiers saying, oh, for example, no more than 5% or no more than 10% deviation from the regulation. It doesn't have any qualifier like that. Um, there's been discussion and quotes from the planning board report that said the modification should be limited to a couple feet or quote one or two feet um, change from the regulations but if you took two square feet over the 26,000 square feet of this property, um, what you're gonna find is a number with a lot of zeros before you get to a digit. Um, in fact, that, that kind of number uh, with five significant digits, it, you can't even get a boundary survey to that degree of accuracy. So the idea that tiny modifications were the only modifications proposed is, is not even practical. You can't measure those kind of changes, even with today's technology. So virtually no modifications could occur if it was just this tiny, tiny slice. Um, but wisely, what was done um, is establishing a standard that we've heard before, is that it, the uh, evaluation needs to show that it is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. And, and we'll talk more about that later. And briefly, just to say that 35-year-old uh, intentions are really kind of outdated. So even if we went back to those intentions, you know, the, the 60s, 70s saw a massive increase in the population of this municipality, more than doubling in that time period. 
and the mid 80s was was the tail end of that so the the political climate the development climate what had happened to the environment and the community it got run over so back then the ideas in the community were different than potentially the ideas today and today we have a housing crisis uh, attorney reedy talks about several mischaracterizations um, that I have presented. And I'm here to say that I have made zero mischaracterizations. Um, and here's how, and I could back this up with a, an extensive amount of evidence, but we're here short on time. So he talks about backing out of the driveway. Um, uh, that, well, you could just back out and turn around and drive out and you'd, it's safe. It is not possible to do that. You cannot back out of that garage turn the car around and get out onto the road. You could never make a right-hand turn. You're gonna go over the, um, uh, unless you have the smallest car out there on the market, you're gonna end up going over the sidewalk. Uh, you could only make a, an obtuse angle uh, left turn, which is unsafe turn, even if there was just one car on the property. If you had three cars on the property, then the turnaround area is now blocked. So it is physically impossible to do anything but back out uh, in almost all situations, and even the best scenario, you're going over the sidewalk and you're making uh, an unsafe approach to that intersection. So you have to back out. That is the only option. Attorney Reedy was not correct in that. There's been a lot of talk about the gravel driveway. So let's take a look at some pictures here. Uh, on the left is a satellite image showing the gravel driveway while it was still being used. Uh, I've outlined it in red. You can see two vehicles parked on it at the time. On the right is from the town's GIS system, which is no kind of guarantee, but uh, the, you know, the, the town, at least at one point, thought that there was a driveway there. If we look at the photo from October's site visit, this is the front of the garage. You can see the gravel that's past the asphalt leading off in that direction. And now that's not evidence, but vehicles currently park here. So the grass is not taking root in this part of the driveway. So you can see that there's still gravel in place. If you follow that around to the back, and I'll bring over here, if you go to the back of the house right here, back of the garage, this was a photo taken today. Neil went out there, he scraped off the frost, and what he did is he took a picture of the stone that is still there in place. So, and he, he showed me other photos of other holes that he dug, but this is the one that showed the garage, so I thought it was the most poignant. There is a gravel driveway. So, Anything related to the driveway not being there is just besides the point. Um, so fortunately, it saves me a lot of time because there's a lot of argument about stormwater and parking and coverage related to that driveway. It's there. Um, so um, to try and skip through this a little bit, um, the stormwater issues aren't, aren't an issue. Heck, even if the driveway wasn't there, the stormwater that I, uh, design that I provided would be unchanged because it is based on 100% of the proposed impervious area, uh, which is greater than the existing conditions with the driveway. So the presence of the driveway one way or another has zero impact on the stormwater uh, analysis that I submitted. Um, and I can skip some of this too. Uh, so additional mischaracterizations. He, uh, Attorney Reedy talks about a photometric plan. These are, in my experience, only for commercial lighting evaluations. Heck, not even all commercial lighting sites get photometric plans. I went and talked to my lighting designer that I, um, I work with regularly who designed most of the lights for the town of Amherst. And I said, hey, we've got this push for a photometric plan for the situation. And when he found out it was for a residence, he laughed at me um, lightheartedly, but it's just not done. And nor could you do that with the type of lights being proposed. And which are permitted because if you have uh, lights that are adjustable as the dark sky uh, area lights are, as soon as you change it, the photometric plan is garbage. So you, you could not even evaluate the lights uh, from a technical standpoint. And um, there's comments in Mr. Reedy's letter talking over and over about um, how single family homes being converted are somehow more worthy of conversion than anything else. But that's not what the bylaw actually says. Um, it says an existing residence, a structure attached or a detached structure may be converted into a dwelling unit. So um, there, he's trying to paint a picture, I think that 
if you're not a single family residence, you shouldn't even be, be attempting this, that the intentions weren't there. But the bylaw allows two types of non-residential structures to be converted. He also has some math errors. I'm, I don't wanna harp on this, not a big deal, um, but he says 92% of the neighborhood consists of single family homes. The correct answer is 65%. There are only 53 single family homes. There are 82 lots in the neighborhood. I think what he was trying to say is 92% of residential lots are single family. We throw out the academic and the, and the cemetery. But if you're gonna take that, there are 53 over 62 lots, that's only 85%, which means that one in seven um, properties in this neighborhood are not single family residences. So uh, having a second dwelling on a property is quite common in this neighborhood. So that again, the impact on the character is, is insignificant. It's we're within the character of the neighborhood. He also talks about 79% of the neighborhood homes are owner occupied. It's actually only 74%. And that also means that one in four homes in this neighborhood are not owner occupied. We're not really doing anything weird here. In attorney Reedy's letter, he talks about requirements of section 9.22, uh, which should be fairly familiar to the board. And um, he's saying that the proposed use uh, as a second dwelling um, is substantially different in character than the use as a garage. And this is about the only thing in the letter that I can say is undeniably true. It's true. A garage is not the same as a residence but it also doesn't matter as far as I can tell because dwelling conversion is always going to be inherently different. You go from one type of building to another type of building. Um, I guess you can go from a residence to a, a two unit residence, but that's also different in character. So it's always going to be different in character by the nature of it being a conversion. And of course I said detached non-residential structures can be converted according to the bylaw. Later, uh, attorney Reedy talks about the proposed use um, is being substantially different in its effect on and more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing use as a garage. And there's a lot of conjecture in these arguments. If you, when you start reading through them, he's saying there's twice as much trash, twice as much noise, traffic, et cetera, 32 people on site, 16 cars. None of that is real. Um, okay, well, there is going to be more trash, but it's going to be in the trash bins. We don't store the trash on the front yard. The same number of trash bins are there. There will be less noise because there are less people allowed to be outside. There will be less traffic because there are fewer cars allowed on the property. 32 people, 16 cars. I don't know where he got that from earlier in the presentation. I showed you the the uh, situation in the original proposal and even the reductions and further restrictions down to just four cars um, and, and a small number of people allowed for social gatherings. Um, so, um, and also uh, there are um, other factors to consider when you're talking about the neighborhood and, and many times uh, the, um, uh, Attorney Reedy and the neighbors have talked about precedent, precedent, precedent. Of course, at the start of every ZBA meeting, the board is never bound by precedent. What happened in the past doesn't matter. Each case is unique. So uh, the, the ramming of the idea of precedent by neighbors and a professional attorney is, is technically meaningless here. However, the impact on the neighborhood is not meaningless. So I'm going to take a look at the property four doors up the street as an example of how the proposal is not going to be a detriment to the neighborhood. At 319 East Pleasant Street, there was a ZBA special permit issued for a dwelling conversion. For the 40 pages of comments and the many days of comments from the public, there are zero complaints about this property. So clearly, converting a dwelling does not automatically create a detriment to the neighborhood. That lot was a thousand square feet smaller than this lot. There were no potential improvements to safety, drainage, aesthetics, and parking that would directly benefit the neighborhood in our proposal for 319 East Pleasant Street. There were no limits placed on vehicles, on undergraduates, on guests, on stormwater. No detriment to the neighborhood. So we are doing far better than what else has occurred. And I don't want to talk about precedent, but what I'm saying is this is already demonstrated not to be a detrimental impact on the neighborhood. Nobody has complained about 319 East Pleasant Street. What they have complained about 
is 289 East Pleasant Street. Now, there's a litany of violations in the record. It is a blight on the neighborhood. I tend to think of it uh, as an animal house based on what I'm hearing from neighbors. Um, but the reason that it is such a problem and why it cannot happen for our proposal is that 289 East Pleasant has no safeguards for the community. It is a uh, by right use, it's non-owner occupied, there's no resident manager, there's no conditions of a special permit controlling what goes on there. So what goes on there is easily problematic. That cannot happen in our proposal. And I'm not sure that the neighborhood is, is aware that it's a wildly different situation uh, where Tommy Loud lives, according to what one of the neighbor calls the residents there. So we have a lot of safeguards in place and we have a very strong incentive to maintain a peaceful property because if the special permit is issued and we don't meet the conditions, this property owner, the Mendelssohn's Pioneer Property Services, they lose their investment, uh, which, is, which is a significant issue. Um, impact on the neighborhood. Oh, for some reason, this did not fit on my screen entirely. So we'll just go with what I have. Um, <clears throat> So this is tantamount to the discussion here this evening. De is what we're proposing substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood because that is the gateway to modifying table three. So impacts on the neighborhood are really important to consider here. So we have a condition of safety where we have reversing into a busy intersection. The proposal will fix that. It will be forward facing departure from the property. Another safety issue, pedestrians versus cars across the sidewalk we are going to have clear visibility. Vehicles are gonna be able to see pedestrians are moving forward again in and out of this property. There have been multiple concerns about drainage, basement flooding. We're gonna capture that water. We are redirecting all of the water. That's all the water from the property that's draining south toward the Larages property, sending it all to the east around their house. In addition to capturing a couple hundred cubic feet of water for each and every storm that uh, hits this um, piece of the earth. Um, lots of comments about aesthetics, 30 years of neglect, we're renovating the exterior. Uh, so many cars in the front yard, that's being eliminated. The paving in the front yard is being eliminated. Uh, lighting, uh, there have been, the lighting is now broadcast, it goes out, there's glare, uh, it's all going to be downcast. Um, there is, um, and currently it's actually possible to park behind the garage. Well, that's never been practical just because it's more to plow uh, for the existing situation. Um, but it could happen now without any screening. We're gonna make sure that a screening fence is installed that has a six foot height and is going to block direct lights. Um, the conversion of a, a creation of a dwelling um, adds a, a reasonably priced family home to the neighborhood stock. Um, there have been comments about a lack of family and professional housing. So again, no undergraduates, families only, uh, outdoor gatherings are being reduced, cars on site are being reduced. <laughs> I might have had more on this slide, um, embarrassingly, but I don't see any detriments to the neighborhood in terms of the impacts to the neighborhood for this proposal. And that, that is critical um, in what we're considering. Uh, so this is you know, where I think most people are waiting for me to get to, right? So just, just to wrap this up, the, the applicant has heard an awful lot and has from the neighborhood and has really pulled back to what they consider their best offer. Um, they're, they're trying to address the needs they do not want the animal house on the corner for, for them or the neighborhood. So they're putting very strong controls in place. Um, we are improving a host of existing problems. So to say that the project is going to be more detrimental utterly ignores safety and drainage and the variety of issues that I just covered that are going to be improved. Um, and adding a family residence in a residential neighborhood I, I do not see how that can have a detrimental impact on the neighborhood's character, especially when people say they want more families and they want more density. So um, I do have additional information. I could go into a lot more details. I'm open to questions. Uh, thank you very much for the time. And hopefully I don't have to address quite as many uh, public comments at the next meeting. Thank you, Mr. Sparkle. Um, I 
now the time for the board to ask questions of um, the applicant. Uh, additional questions. We had some time earlier, but there's new information, and uh, we can have the opportunity to ask further questions. Now. Um, the first one I want to talk about is is the stormwater um, calculations that you proposed. So. Um, the dry, is the dry in, in your calculation, what you're really trying to tell us is the delta between the existing conditions and the new driveway is um, like, I think it's 400 and some square feet, 460 square feet. Four, yeah, 473, and, right, but yes. 473 square feet. And is, is what you're doing saying, I'm gonna take care of 470 square feet of impervious um, surface water. And that's what I'm, I, water that is on 470 square feet uh, of impervious area. And that's what I have the rain garden for, or is yours for the entire um, area of the, of the backyard and the driveway and all the front yard areas that slope to the back? Mm -hmm. How much are you, what area, what are you, what are you taking care of in that calculation? Yes, so the, the stormwater calculations I mean, for these situations, they're always tricky because there are zero standards that apply. And both Jason right. Skills and I would really love some standards. Um, and that would even allow a peer review because you can't even peer review something like this. But what I've done in the past and what I've done here, particularly at Neil's insistence to try and improve conditions for the Larages downstream of them, uh, is I have considered 100% of the impervious area proposed for the property. I am looking to capture they call the first flush volume, which is the most polluted volume uh, of, of water that comes off this site and infiltrate 100% of that volume into the ground before any water moves off site. So it is based on all of the proposed impervious area. So when you take, you, do you currently consider the gravel um, driveway impervious? It's quasi pervious. So how do you, so right now that's like 600 square, 1600 square feet. If I look at your, at the earlier, uh, it, the existing gravel driveway is 1588 square feet. Um, okay. And you, then you have an addition, the next driveway is gonna be 470 square feet bigger than that. So let's call it 2000 square feet of impervious area that you will have with a new parking plan in the driveway behind the house. So are you saying that you're, you're, um, you're capturing all the water coming off, off that 2000 square feet? Are you just capturing the difference between what is currently there and the, the, the 1688 or 1588 square feet and the 470 square feet? Are you just capturing that 475? Or are you capturing it all? This is where standards would be helpful. Um, because I don't have a simple answer to what seems like a simple question. <clears throat> the, I, I'm not capturing all of the water that comes off of that property for every storm. What I'm capturing is the first half inch of rainfall that falls on the impervious area. I'm capturing 100% of that flow. Um, and it comes out to 160 some cubic feet of water. To put that into perspective, if you were to apply commercial stormwater standards to this site, due to the increase in impervious area of only being 400 and some square feet. If you had the 100 year storm, which is almost eight inches of rain in 24 hours, if you had a storm that big hit this property at a commercial development, you would be required to capture 140 some cubic feet of water. I'm capturing 160 some cubic feet of water. So if you were to take commercial standards, we're exceeding them presently with this design. And so I'm, I'm not an engineer and <laughs> you are, so I'm gonna try to get this one more time, see if I can get this right. How much of the, the gravel driveway, that absorbs water right now. Some water is absorbed by that, yes. but you, right? And you're still counting that as an impervious surface. Quasi-impervious. So, well, but what, so what I'm, what I'm saying is that it see, appears to me that if you tar over, if you asphalt over all that ground and it'd be an additional 400 and some square feet, you have more than just the 
you have the delta increase of water is more than just the 400 square feet because there's be some percolation to that 1,600, 1,588 square feet of existing driveway, right? And That's I don't correct. know if you, and That's I, I don't know how you've how you've thought about that. Okay. So the way when you're that was considered, it's a built into the. I built a model in HydroCAD, a hydrological modeling software that I put in all the areas for grass, roof, gravel, asphalt, walkway, all of that, even the stone walls. I have modeled in in HydroCAD to get some some meaningful numbers that helped assist me in coming up with a good judgment call and a robust system because Neil wanted to make sure we put in a robust system. Um, so in when you're evaluating asphalt, uh, there's, there's something called a curve number. So basically the, the asphalt has a curve number of 98. So you can think of it as 98% impervious. There are cracks in asphalt. Small amount of water gets through. Um, after a couple of years of it being there. Um, gravel has a curve number of 96. So you can think of it as 96% impervious. So the difference between asphalt and gravel is just about 2% in terms of its imperviousness. So it, it is nearly uh, as impervious as asphalt when you're doing these types of calculations. Uh, uh, gravel has silt and clay and fine grains in it that bind it together and as a result water sheds off of it very very readily water does not soak into gravel it can soak into stone like pea stone if you had an open pea stone that's very different but you also can't really drive over that very well it would just slide around on you i might be going off track here uh, yeah i'm i'm concerned about the the permeability of the or the lack of the, the, I'm, I'm concerned that adding the additional asphalt covering up the gravel you that there's not enough um not enough water being captured in your rain gardens and that's that's and i'm not the that's my concern i've got to work with that and you've tried to answer it but i do have that concern um and when i look at the sure when i look at the plans and and where we are a little stuck in this conversation because the question is, is there enough? Against what standard can I, can I make that call? What I've done is what I've done for every other residential application in front of the ZBA, actually that or better than anything that I've done in the past that has been deemed adequate um, is capture the first flush off of impervious area because that happens to coincide with um, a lot of the commercial stormwater standards uh, for certain size storms that are reasonable. Uh, of course, the, uh, the, the state rules say that you could add as much impervious area to the site as you want, and you have no obligation to detain, retain, infiltrate, clean it up. None of that is required by the only standard. Um, of course, you have to, in the bylaws, address flooding hazards, et cetera, without any standards applied for that. So what I've done is what's worked um, every other time that I have presented exactly this type of application to the town of Amherst, um, but I made it just a little more robust in this particular case. Um, I'd like to open it up for questions from other members of the board and I can come back to my questions, uh, other questions later. Do other board members have questions? Mr. Maxfield. Uh, yeah, there was, um was mentioned of being open to the board putting a condition prohibiting the, the renting to undergraduates. And I guess my question here is actually to, to the board, have we done anything like that in the past? And are we even able to, to make such a condition? Uh, how would we, how exactly would we go about barring undergraduates? I, I don't think we're allowed to, to bar people based on their, their age. Of whether or not they're allowed to to rent a property or not it's uh, not but, an know, age I, we're gonna you know I, I think mr maxfield that's a good question to ask town staff um my impression is that we could that you can restrict it to families but you know that's i don't have a, a legal foundation for that so i think either mr mora uh, mr bard or mr waschevich uh, waskevich please opine on that if you would. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Joel Bard, I'll be happy to jump in and uh, interested to hear from the building commissioner's office. 
so this would be a condition, and, and of course it's a, a question I'm sure is on everybody's mind. So the way it's being presented to the board, it's a condition being requested by the applicant. And I think that's an important distinction. And it's a condition that would be imposed by the landlord. Yes, it would be part of the special permit, but I think it would be a tougher question, possibly, uh, I'm not gonna opine on it, but if the board were to impose it unilaterally, but the property owner prospective landlord is looking to impose the condition. So that uh, doesn't trouble me given that it's coming from the landlord. And in terms of, so uh, can a landlord then say that I'm not renting to students. So students or specifically undergraduate students, students are not a protected class. So it's not making any distinction, any kind of form of discrimination against you know, the different kinds of categories uh, against which you can't discriminate. So uh, a property owner can make that decision. And as you've heard, and I'm sure you've heard it as you've heard as part of this hearing, and I'm sure you've heard it in your years in Amherst, um, a group of students aren't necessarily the best caretakers of an apartment. So certainly any landlord can say, I'm just not gonna rent to a group of four undergraduates. So in my opinion, uh, it is, if requested by an applicant as you have been, it is a condition you could impose. Now the good question, uh, in addition to put the um, building department staff on the spot is how do you enforce that condition? I think that'll be an important understanding yeah. to have with the landlord, with the recipient of the special permit. But yes, in my opinion, under these circumstances, you can do it. And then Mr. Moore, or Mr. Wiskevitz, how would you, how would you enforce such a condition? I mean, certainly would be, yeah, answer, how would you enforce that? Yes, uh, well, to, to answer Mr. Maxfield's question, we have not done this yet. Uh, it's something that has been talked about over the years. Um, and as Mr. Uh, Attorney Bard laid out, uh, it, this is a little different because the applicant's actually suggesting it. Uh, so we haven't gone so far as to try to make it a condition because we always felt like enforcement would be challenging. Uh, it, it, it seems like it's a piece of information about uh, a tenant that would be difficult for us to obtain uh, and be able to do anything uh, meaningful to correct it. So I think, you know, this really has to be uh, a pretty uh, a thorough part of the management plan by the applicant to show the board how, uh, how this condition that they're uh, suggesting would be actually applied in, in the, the uh, rental and, and uh, oversight of the property. And Mr. Chair, if I can jump in on that. So uh, if the yes, board Mr. chooses Bard. to go in, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Bard. Thank you, I'm sorry. Uh, if the board chooses to go in that direction, uh, the wording of the special permit to address the issues that Mr. Mora just raised would be important. In other words, mm -hmm. to give, uh, to require that that information be provided to the town so that the town can enforce. Yeah. So if I, under, um, go ahead, Mr. Maxwell, you, you, you asked the question, you should finish it. No, that, that was, uh, that answered my question of, of, is there a way we, we could impose that? And then it's, uh, I think we'd have to think about how, if we wanted to go in that direction, how we would want to word that condition and then work with town staff on how that would actually be enforced. But that answered my question of, can we put that condition on there? But Mr. Mora, it seems to me that what you said is that we'd have to structure a condition that placed additional responsibilities on the landlord to ascertain that the tenants in the in the new unit were not students and were all in a, a single family, all were, were all related, and then have to assert that or um, um, certify that some way to the town, as opposed to the town going out and trying to do that itself. And then we'd have to rely upon the um, diligence of the landlord and his his uh, willingness to comply with those um, provisions, those restrictions and those ascertainment provisions, for lack of a better term. Uh, and we'd have to rely upon that, it seems. Is that what you're saying? 
It is. That's correct. Okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Maxfield. Uh, and just another question. I know it was mentioned. Um, well, specifically, what uh, what would happen with snow removal on the um, on the driveway? Where where would that be moved to, and how would that affect um, water runoff or or any kind of flooding? Where would that go? Okay, so let me skip to this. is This is the older plan. It's just it's colored, so I'm gonna. I'm going to jump into that. This is the one without the annotations from the DPW and fire department. Um, we have uh, snow stockpile areas uh, at this point designated to the east of the driveway here, parking area, and to the south on this side. The gradient of this site drains toward the rain garden, so anything piled over here will drain to the south and this is going to be a, a designated low point in the property. So uh, melting snow will end up uh, heading, heading down uh, in this direction right toward the rain garden. Parks is raising her hand. Ms. Parks. Um, okay. I just wanted to go um, back to the other question. Not all undergraduate students are the same, and I'm pretty sure that the wording there was preferred, that families would be preferred. Um, In the farmhouse, they are. I thought that was the language otherwise. I, I would not be as comfortable putting a condition on to say who, like restricting who you would rent to. I, you know, I, we would, uh, you would prefer someone who's not destructive, but I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't feel comfortable saying you, that you couldn't rent to students or you couldn't rent to a student. Um, and we're yeah. trying to address the concerns of the community. I, if that restriction is not included, it still doesn't change the property owner's intention to avoid undergraduates because of the inherent problems that come with them. They're trying to make a nice property and build it up over time and renting it out to undergrads is, is contrary to their intentions and contrary to the value of their investment. So if, if there's no uh, inf uh, condition requiring that, great. The, the intention remains the same. The owner does not want them there and will avoid them if they can. The current condition, as I explained, with undergraduates is a favor to a family friend due to a shift in life circumstances uh, as a result of COVID. Mr. Um, are you, any other questions, Mr. Parks? Any follow-up? I, I have other questions, but I'll, you can come back go to ahead. me. Go ahead. Okay. You go, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so on, on slide number seven, you were talking about how the space is larger in uh, in the garage, um, and I'm so uh, you were saying the living space or the bedroom. Um, I'm looking at at, the, at your plan here, and the size of the bedrooms are uh, one is 112 square feet and one is 107 square feet, and there's also uh, 12 foot uh, square foot closets in there. So effectively, one bedroom is 100 square feet and one is 95 square feet. It's um maybe how I presented it in the, the compact form is a little confusing. So let me uh, tell you how these numbers came to be. These numbers are the living space of the entire building, the dwelling, divided by the number of bedrooms. So the farmhouse, according to the assessor card, has 884 square feet of living space. And when you divide that by the three bedrooms, you get 295 square feet available for each bedroom in the building. That doesn't mean the bedroom is 295 because the kitchen, the common space, all of that is rolled in. If you look at the converted uh, garage, that's 900 and it's close to 950 square feet, but that's only over two bedrooms. So if you divide 950 by two, you get about 458. So it's not bedroom size, it's living space per uh, bedroom in that dwelling unit. Am, am I being clear? Yeah, so my, my other question is, in, in the other documentation, it looks like um, you there's expected to be four people in each unit, so it would be eight people uh, living there, and 
I guess I have a question about if there's four parking spaces, what is the expectation for the other four people? Well, as has been uh, discussed in other applications and um, with the ZBA and in this case as well, uh, you know, it, it goes back to a couple of things. One, um, the, the bylaws require only two uh, parking spaces per dwelling. If it's one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, it's two parking spaces, uh, as I understand. So there's a, a slight disconnect there just in the bylaw, but there was very strong pushback uh, from the neighborhood that six cars would be too many. Um, I, I think originally there was a preference for six parking spaces because there are um, originally six proposed, now five proposed uh, bedrooms. Yes, more people can live there, but as has been uh, brought up multiple times and is quite obvious, uh, this is uh, a location that the, for the employment and the graduate student body in UMass, you don't need a car. Um, it's, um, we've got the schools nearby, the high school, the middle school, you don't have to drive your kids to school and the tenants that would arrive here, you know, pay a market rate that indicates that there is limited parking. If you have unlimited parking, you would pay a higher market rate. So it, it just isn't possible to bring, uh, more than two cars on the property as a result of the public pushback. If, if the board is interested in more parking, I'm sure the applicant would consider it. There's certainly room. I could increase the size of the rain garden accordingly. Um, so if, if the concern is there is too little parking, that can certainly be rectified. I'm, I'm just concerned about where other people are gonna park. And I'm also considering if guests are visiting, are they gonna go back and park exactly where the cars are parked currently yeah. in, uh, over the sidewalk? Well, the, the sidewalk will have a barrier curb put up across it. There won't be pavement there. There won't be gravel there. It'll be a yard. Um, so uh, I would certainly hope that people decide not to go parking on a yard. And uh, the, uh, personally, I think this site would be better suited for six vehicles. I do know that across the street, literally, uh, uh, Friday night and all day on the weekends through Monday morning, you do not need a permit to park. So if there are weekend gatherings, there is effectively unlimited parking across the street. Then um, one of the UMass lots, I think it's number 49. You do need a permit during the week, but for uh, starting at 5 p.m. on Friday, anybody can park there. So uh, they would have to coordinate a little bit, carpool a little bit. Um, and we're, we're trying to reduce traffic. So this is, our attempt to you know, make things better for the neighborhood and reduce trips, we reduce the amount of parking spaces and limit that. Okay. All set. Mr. Langsdale. Okay. Um, uh, right off the bat, uh, parking is uh, two spaces per unit. We have two units, four parking spaces. That's all. Um, that goes in to uh, the permit. It goes in as a condition. Uh, if that is uh, abridged, then uh, there can be fines and other things uh, levied. Um, a couple quick things, Mr. Sparkle. Uh, you talk about the aesthetics of the place uh, and renovating the exterior of the uh, barn, uh, excuse me, garage. Um, does that include renovating the exterior of the house uh, from uh, inspection and uh, photos that we have just been given, of course? Um, there are many places in the siding of the house where it's deteriorated, broken, uh, and painted over. Uh, so does that, does that renovation extend to the house beyond just putting a new roof on? Um, as to the lighting, uh, yes, uh, what is proposed is uh, dark sky compliant. Um, as to uh, concerns for the public um, about the two spotlights for the back, uh, those would be dark sky compliant, but they would also be, uh, it would also be uh, 
that they would be required to be downcast, not shooting out. Um, Absolutely. The other thing, uh, one other thing is uh, the first lady who spoke during the public comments, I'm sorry, I did not get her name, uh, talked about, uh, at the end of her statement, talked about a brush that she had asked your client to remove and has not yet been removed. If that's true, um, I think that might be something that should be dealt with tomorrow or as soon as possible. Uh, certainly at least in terms of um, neighborly goodwill. Um, yes. Yeah, okay, that's all I have for now, thanks. Um, I am I am texting with the client right now because I can't just lean over and, and have a conversation with him. But um, the, all right, so he, uh, Neil confirms that there are plans to continue repair of the siding uh, for the existing farmhouse, including painting it. So that, like I said, it's, it's a long game. It's, it's a big investment. There's a lot of money necessary for that uh, garage dwelling conversion, but some funds are being expended on the property overall. And he is saying that tomorrow that brush will be gone. Thank you. Other questions from board members? Mr. Sparkle, I, when we talk about parking, um, I'm concerned about how well the parking will be monitored and policed by the landlord. The current situation is I've driven past that house several times over the last few months just to see what the situation is. And I'm and often there are four or five cars parked along that um, property uh, all lined up much more so than the two that are supposed to be parked there and two on the side. And I worry that, well, you, it'll be an improvement to have the cars behind the garage uh, and you won't be able to park right up against the garage. You could still have cars that are parked off to the side of the driveway. I'm, yeah, also, I... concerned that, I'm also concerned that the current rental permit provides for parking in the garage and two on the side at an angle when at le left of the garage at an angle and that's not ever and that's not the case at all it's not being done and the the, the owner doesn't even pretend that it has been um, his intent to have those cars garaged in the garage as the rental permit would require mm -hmm. so I, I'm, I'm really sensitive and sympathetic to the concerns raised by the neighbors about parking and enforcement of, the, of any kind of parking conditions when the, there hasn't been um, a witness, we haven't witnessed um, compliance with the existing rental permit uh, right now. And so I'm wondering if yes. you could speak to that. I am going to speak to that. Um, regarding um, the, the number of parking spaces, I think that was the first and how to keep it to just four, what are the safeguards in place? Well, uh, right now there is no resident manager on the property. Uh, so it's, there, it's you know, the, the property manager manages the property and they are not there all of the time. So we would have a full-time resident manager on site with a special permit and with the neighborhood being quite aware of every word we're saying now, um, and as well as their involvement in the community, I am pretty confident that the conditions of the special permit, um, if they are not met, then we will hear about it. And that will give the Pioneer Property Services an opportunity to correct that situation immediately uh, to, to make sure that the conditions are maintained. Presently, there is no special permit. Yes, there is a parking management plan. Um, uh, I, I, I do see and have seen photographs where there are more than four vehicles parked on the property that are parked on the gravel driveway, uh, but, but it's more that is in the permit. Um, and, I, and I guess I'm, I'm not familiar with the uh, requirements and impact of a, of a parking permit. Uh, 
as to say what what happens if you don't follow up on a rental um, on a rental permit application if your parking plan is not adhered to strictly. Uh, so I, I think I'm a little bit ignorant uh, in that realm. It's not a bylaw issue. So uh, I, I would just say that you know due to the proposed special conditions and the presence of a resident manager, um, as well as the ability of the abutters to say, hey, this isn't working. Uh, there, there are going to be controls in place in the future that are just simply not there now. Okay, um, but that would mean that the the renters have to, or the the, the neighbors would have to contact the um, the owner at some point. Well, the, the, the resident manager. That's what the, the resident, resident manager is for. Um, okay, but even I I understand, and I think you've made a good case. The concern I have is that even with in this time since October, when we've had this before us, there has been continued to be problems with um, too many cars parked there and not parked along the, um, and the parking hasn't complied with the rental um, re permit requirements. So it, it is, a. am not sure that the rent, I, I hope that the resident manager would solve that problem, but I'm, I have some suspicion and some concern about that. Well, I know the stakes will be higher with a special permit. Yep, Mr. Langsdale. Yeah, I would like to say that given that over the last months, as uh, Mr. Judge has talked about, there have been cars parked there, three, four, maybe more, uh, in front of the garage, which constitutes a really um, dangerous situation because they have to back into Strong Street. So all of the concern about having the cars in a parking lot coming up and facing, uh, I don't quite understand. However, what I'm concerned about is that that practice of more than what? Well, two cars, because right now there's one unit, which is the house, two cars, there are continuously being three, four, or five cars parked there, again, backing into the Strong Street, that it, it speaks to, and, and I know it's a minor thing, but this brush that has not been uh, taken away that the owner said he would take away, and it's been, I don't know how long that, that that's been true, it speaks to how, can the neighbors trust what the owner says he will do? And because apparently it hasn't really happened in terms of the parking as it is at present. How does the neighborhood trust that what he says he will do will happen. Um, yes, we can put conditions on, but it shouldn't be up to the neighbors to say there's, you know, eight cars down there instead of four. Um, I don't know. I mean, it, I, I think it, 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 it speaks to the problem with what a, a uh, what we're dealing with with this application, that it will be done the way it's said that it will be done, um, when things haven't quite been done that way up to this point. Um, I would also like to hear from Mr. Mora in terms of if there, the parking is slated at four cars, period, um, what are the, the uh, and, and if it goes beyond that continuously, if it becomes a real problem, what kind of uh, sanctions or fees can be levied against the property and the owner uh, for not abiding by the condition? Um, okay, anyway, thank you. Mr. Mora, can you, um respond to Mr. Langsdale's question? Yes, uh, the 
parking plan, uh, current parking plan or a future approved parking plan does become a condition of the residential rental permit, uh, which is a uh, um, general bylaw. And that comes with a penalty for any violation of that, uh, that permit or any of its conditions that comes with a penalty of $100 per day uh, for each violation. Uh, typically, there's some period of time that a code enforcement officer, after receiving the complaint, will monitor the property to, to try to understand what the regular condition is to establish a violation and, uh, you know, 99% of the time simply asking the owner to uh, do something to better manage the situation does take care of it. Uh, but uh, for those cases that that does not happen in a, in a um, you know, responsive enough way, the $100 uh, per day fine is uh, what would be imposed. Um, I, I'm curious if there has been um, any uh, contact from the, the rental agreement or the town to reach out to the owner and let them know that they are in violation. Has that happened? Have they been given notice? That's, you know, Mr. Sparkle, um, that's really a, a, an enforcement question, not really a, a zoning question sure. for us. Okay. I mean, but but it would be his response. It would be the land. It would be the landlord's responsibility to comply with his, the rental permit that he um, signed. So sure. he, he should he should know that that's the case. Uh, but we don't do the enforcement. Um, you should clearly know the case, uh, know what um, parking requirements are part of his rental permit. Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Mora is uh, raising oh, his hand. Oh, Mr. Mora. Uh, yeah, I, I, I see that you wanted to move on from that, but I do think that's an important yeah. point to uh, just stop and think about for a minute is that um, the, the town's inspection and code enforcement office is designed to be a complaint response uh, team. Uh, so we're not out there patrolling the town. We're not out there looking for this situation. We wouldn't otherwise know about it without this discussion tonight, unless a neighbor or somebody called to tell us about it. So it really is important that uh, the owner of the property is held to uh, this standard to, to ensure that the property is well managed. And what we know is that some properties are much more challenging to, uh, than others to manage. And if this is a condition that sounds like, you know, uh, Mr. Chair noted that you saw this uh, a few times over the last couple of months, if it's a regular occurrence, it sounds like this property needs to be managed in a little different way than it has been in the past so that the owner of the property, the, the landlord or the property manager has taken the responsibility to ensure compliance with the rental permit bylaw and the conditions of that permit. I believe that the this significance of the parking situation is is likely becoming far more clear uh, and, and imminent in the minds of Pioneer Property Services through this very discussion. Um, and I, in my conversations with him, which is, you know, how I know the individual, uh, they, they really do seem like they, they want to take care of things as this process unfolds and they are able to, to reach their goals for the property. Um, uh, they're, they're, they seem to me to be very willing to make changes and they're, they're open to adjusting things according to uh, neighbors' concerns and, and uh, regulations. So uh, I mean, that's probably about as much as I can say because I, am, I yep. am not the property manager uh, and I can't yep. make promises for somebody else, uh, of course. Um, but it does seem to me that they, they do have clear intention. And of course, if, if it does not go according to the permit, fines are available, they can lose their special permit. So the, the, again, the stakes would be much higher in a proposed condition than the, the current by right use with a, a rental agreement uh, permit. Mr. Sparkle, I, um, in your presentation, you talk about strongly, um, or in, last week in what you submitted, strongly um, blocking the light from the cars from the neighbors. You have, uh, there's a bank of, of uh, Arborvitae, I think, and then yeah. you propose a fence. Um, can, we, can you pull up that so we can take a look at that? 
and see how, because some of the neighbors had, had concerns about that. So I'm wondering yeah. how well the fence will solve the problem. Okay, so let's first look at the fence that's being proposed. It's a six foot tall fence um, with solid boards. Uh, th this one is e existing. It's uh, the only fence of the type and it's going to be replicated. Uh, I think that the gaps in the original construction uh, would necessarily be eliminated because the, the purpose of the fence is to make sure nothing penetrates. So for the first you know, five feet or so off the ground, which is far higher than the headlights of any vehicle, uh, is, is going to be a solid wall. And the placement of that, and I'll zoom in just a little bit here. Um, the placement of that wall um, is starts at the, uh, the south end of the parking spaces that face the direction of the Larages property and then extend further further up just to provide an, an additional layer so there's more screening toward uh, the northern portions through here. Um, I think you can also see that the Larages have parking spaces where the headlights shine to the west. That's not part of the application but um, you know some, something to consider about you know, people who have concerns about light intrusion also have unscreened headlights. And in terms of the um, existing vegetation, you can see I've got you know a generic green area over here, um, and whoa, what that looks like um, is this. Uh, it's not arborvitae; it is hemlock as far as the evergreens hemlock. go. And additional, um, additionally, there are a few deciduous trees, which of course don't offer the same level of protection in the mm -hmm. winter. And if we zoom in just a little bit, you can just make out the siding and part of the roof of the abutting property. Um, so there, the fence would go, uh, as you can see this brush pile that's gonna be gone tomorrow, which um, by the way, the, my client said that one of the reasons he hasn't done it is because he's been fearful of bringing out the chainsaw, which would be necessary to break it up. Um, he's been you know, a little bit uh, afraid of the complaints from the neighbors. So I, I think he was paralyzed there, but obviously he, he realizes that they much rather have the brush gone and deal with the chainsaw. Um, so that uh, they should expect a chainsaw tomorrow, I guess, but uh, the, so the let's fence- get back to the fence. The fence would go across this area here. Okay. It would start where your, your hand is it now? It actually starts a little bit off the screen okay. if, if my estimate is correct and the parking area is roughly here and it extends slightly and off the screen. And the parking lot is how many feet higher than, because everything drains away that way. So are we looking two feet higher than the, uh, the tree line approximately? Uh, everything's at existing grade. So basically if you remove the grass and put in the parking area, what you see is what you get in the proposed condition. Well, I know it's at the existing grade, but the existing grade slopes away, I think. Does it not slope it, it does. downward? So yep. that the parking lot would be higher than the, uh, the, the level of the, the soil at the trees the ground at the trees, it'd be one or two feet higher, right? Uh, yes, yeah. so we have elevation okay. um, 93 in the rain garden, 94 down here, 95 up here. Okay, so it's a foot, we're talking about a foot at the most. A All right. Of, right, and it's a five foot fence, so effectively it's a- uh, it's, it's a, a six foot, foot it's a six foot fence with five feet being fully obfuscated. And four, in this case, four feet would be fully obfuscated because right. it's because it's higher than the than the level of fence. Okay. All right, but I, it's, in this case, it seems like the the fence is going to do the best job of of screening because um, it's some of the some of that um, hemlock is and brush would provide screen, but some is going to be you know porous to light. So the fence, I think the fence has to be a solid fence in order to provide lighting uh, screening for the neighbors. Yeah, that's the intention. And the other thing is that when you when you back out of the, the spots there, if you look at um, the spot at the spot on the top of this, and they back out to go up the the um, uh, the driveway, mm -hmm. that backing out will shine light at least as far as that um, that fence goes. But that would probably not go. I don't know if that would hit the corner of the house, the bedroom, or whatever this is for the Larajas, but. I'm not. I'm not sure. It's, I don't sure it extends far enough to block 
uh, light flow to the house. So that might be a concern that we may want to look at in a condition to make sure that the light, um, the fence blocks the light totally from uh, to hitting their house. So that's just something to think about. I'm not sure that it does that at the current um, dimensions. Okay, uh, let's see okay. if I can bring a line up. And if you were to draw a line uh, from the end of that building to the end of the fence, uh, any lights that would be on the below this line and turning and rotating uh, would not reach that building. Um, eventually, it will shine out into their parking lot into the road as vehicles turn and complete that maneuver. And if we needed to put an additional fence section on and go from 32 feet to a 40 foot fence. I don't think that's a problem for. Yeah, I'm, that's what I'm suggesting is you may want to think about a longer fence. Um, I, I don't think that's a problem. We can, we can definitely do a, a longer fence. Um, be happy to enter into a discussion with that neighbor to make sure that the placement was to their satisfaction even. Um, we show up with that 32 foot or 40 fence and, and the neighbor can help put it where they want it. There may be areas of their house that, I mean, we don't know where all the windows are in this particular yeah. image. So uh, that can be personalized and customized in the moment. Okay, good. Um, are there any question, other questions from board members for the applicant? Okay. Um, so it, it seems to me that we're in a position tonight where at least one board member, and I think maybe others, um, would is not prepared yet to make a decision on this application. That there are other things that um, we need to, to, to review. One is I think we need to have more time for to review the um, the legal memo that we received on Monday. I think it'd be really helpful if Mr. Sparkle's presentation was sent to us so that we could review that um, his his um, uh, responses to uh, abutters and neighbors' concerns. I think that'd be helpful for us as well to have. We we saw this here at the at the uh, meeting and not ahead of time. So your, your presentation would be valuable for us to have and to, to chew on. Um, I think before we, we have to, to decide on this application, we have a lot of very um, important steps we have to take. We have to make decisions about, we have to make findings that are um, on 9.22, we have to make findings on 3.3, 3.241 about the converted dwellings. And we have all the 10.9, 10.38 findings that we have to make, all of which involve questions of nuis nuisance to neighbors and the ability of the, the property owner to have the, the converted dwelling in this place. We have to make certain findings about the effect on the neighborhood. And I think that um, some of the, and we also need to have more information. I think I need more information about the, um, about the, the flow, uh, the rainwater flow from uh, the increased area of impermanence. Because when I when we were there before, it looked like grass to me. Um, when we walked down the the in the backyard and looked at the the site visit, it was um, it looked like grass to me, and I was unaware that there was a driveway there. So I think that that is probably not a, a pure calculations are probably um, that it absorbs more water than a pure and a real uh, gravel. Um, driveway would because it's it's grass that has grown up and through kind of an abandoned driveway. I have, we have those questions. So my my thought would be for us to continue this um, this matter until the next our next meeting. Um, give people time to discuss this, uh, chew on the or not to discuss it. Obviously, we can't do that, but to to think about it, to chew on the the legal issues that were raised and to perhaps um, hear some responses from as quickly as possible on rainwater and other fence and the other things that, that were raised, the concerns of the neighbors and concerns of the board members were raised. 
Um, and I'd like to throw that open to people on the board to see what kind of a response they have to that. If they are indeed ready to make a decision, please let me know. But um, my sense from the discussion is that we're probably not ready to do that at this time. So I'd like to throw that out to, because I don't want to push this before we're ready to make a decision. So do any board members have an opinion on whether they're ready or not to make the decision tonight? Mr. Maxfield. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm not necessarily sure that I'm, I'm ready to make a decision right now tonight, but if the board would like with the remaining time that we have, I'd like to have a little bit of a discussion amongst ourselves on kind of what my thinking is right now on this project and hear a little bit of where everyone else is thinking on this project. So over the next uh, two weeks between now and, and when we would uh, ideally make a vote on this, um, we all kind of know what we're, we're all kind of considering here and, and looking at. Um, and, and if it's all right, I, I can go ahead and, and, and start what, what my thinking on this project is right now at this time. Um, can, can I make one real quick yeah. request? Can we stop the screen share so we can see each other? Oh, yes, here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I have a question. Uh, I, I think, I think what Mr. Hatfield is talking about is the board to be talking with each other about this, and that's going to the public meeting, which means we cut off the public hearing. I propose that rather than doing that, we uh, have uh, an executive meeting about this, uh, which is of course open to the public, uh, but would be specifically about our uh, talking about this uh, project um, at a different time. I'm not sure I understand, Mr. Langsdale, what, what your suggestion is. Can you repeat that again? Yeah. I, I, uh, <laughs> Um, it, to, to do what Mr. Maxfield would like to do, which I agree with, I, I think that means that at this point in time, it means we would have to close the hearing and go to the public meeting. Um, and I think that's not what we want to do at this point in time. So how do we go forward with that then, I guess? I agree that I don't think we're ready to close the public hearing. There may be more information that comes in the right. next few days, in the next two weeks before our next meeting that we don't want to preclude ourselves from receiving. So I'd want to keep the, I'd want to keep the public hearing open. I will leave it up to, I will ask um, staff whether we can engage in discussion amongst ourselves in a public hearing about the, uh, about our concerns. I'm thinking that we, I'm thinking that we can have a, a discussion amongst board members during a public hearing um, about various aspects of the application. What I, what I think is, is unique about the public meeting is that we tend not to have public input at that point. It is only discussion between ourselves unless, except for extraordinary circumstances where we need to get some um, outside influence, outside input. But I'm, I'm thinking that we probably can can have a public, we can continue the public hearing and have a discussion among ourselves. But I'd like to ask, you know, either um, Rob, uh, Mr. Mora, or or um, Mr. Washevitz, what um, we can uh, do. Uh, Mr. Or Chair, Mr. Bard. Um, Attorney Bard uh, would like to speak. Yep. Yes, Mr. Bard. Oops, you're. Oh, you might be. Is he, oh, muted. you are muted. Sorry about that. Uh, Yes, the board can do that. Uh, you know, typically you close the public hearing and then have a discussion among the members, but it's perfectly acceptable and common for board members to have a discussion among themselves at whatever level of specificity, you know, that your members choose, and then see if you want to seek further public comment. Uh, so yeah, you can do it either way. And certainly, of course, can close the public hearing and then have your own discussion, but there's no reason why you can't have uh, an informal or however you want to stage it, a discussion while the public hearing is still open. Okay. Mr. Meadows. Um, I, I agree with what 
what Mr. Maxfield was saying, uh, there's a piece of information that I would like based upon a comment that you made that there are some stip stipulations for the existing building that have not been met, which is the use of the garage rather than the parking area in front of the garage. Are there any other conditions that existed for that, for that site? Um, and I'd like to know what those conditions are uh, so that we, that, that would have an influence definitely on, on what our ultimate decisions are. So, um, Mr. Meadows, what you're asking for, I, I think the town building department can provide you or the, I don't know who, who's provide the, the rental permit information and the, rest, the restrictions and the parking plan can be provided to you through that. You can provide it to all of us, I think would be helpful. Please. Okay. Mr. Maxfield. Uh, yeah, that was actually going to be um, one of the things I, I, I'd like to know because I've heard uh, a lot of anecdotes about um, issues happening at this property. And I'm wondering if, if there's been any formal complaints that, that we've received at the town of violations being committed uh, at this property. Um, that would definitely be very helpful in, in making this decision. Um, I know right now the things I'm considering uh, with this property is I know there's been a lot of talk about the the size of the lot and uh, the exceptions being allowed for you know maybe one or two feet kind of thing and it seems like the property and the, and the structures that are there the structures are currently there there's no necessarily new structure the only uh, new uh, surface area that's going up would be the the driveway, which our, our own engineer said they believe it would improve safety as well as, as water runoff, which is you know, my major concern with putting more impervious surface when, when we're already hearing from neighbors about issues of flooding, where those are now both being addressed. So I, I don't see, um, I don't see that, the, the, the lot size being a, a major issue here when we're talking about a garage, a structure that's, if they were trying to build that garage that this proposal was, we're gonna build a garage there or build a, another structure, I think the answer would be absolutely not that that lot is undersized and this is not the intention. Um, but I think in this case where that, that garage is already there, it's a structure that currently exists that's being converted. I, I think that the argument on the lot size doesn't quite apply here. And I'd like to hear from other board members their, their thoughts on that, that issue of the undersized lot. I, I will say that it's my opinion that, mm -hmm. um, that both of the structures on this lot, which is quite small, are uh, very close to both uh, East Pleasant Street and Strong Street, uncomfortably close to those two, two roads, which are fairly major roads. Um, it's access to Wildwood School with children going across there consistently. And the fact that the cars are parked there in, alongside the existing garage um, frequently in excess of what is anticipated is both a hazard because of the way that they come out of the bill, out of the parking area that they're in right now, but it's also a hazard because if you're walking or running, you have to walk around, um, around the cars and onto the street. Uh, I, I don't understand why the garage was not being used for some time, if that was one of the stipulations for uh, the rental units to begin with. Um, and I, I find that uh, because of the configuration, um, adding more the uh, addition of the dwelling units in the garage 
would, um, would not be in keeping with the rest of the neighborhood. My opinion. Mr. Langsdale. Yeah, uh, to that, um, the parking as it is now is, I mean, we have comments from uh, different uh, neighbors. I have uh, Mr. Cobb's letter. I have um, Ira Brick's letter, uh, both of which are talking about uh, the traffic problems um, and that uh, making this change would cause even more problems. However, the cars that are parked there now have to, as we we're just saying, have to back out into uh, Strong Street. And especially if they want to go west, they have to back in, go across the, uh, a whole lane of traffic to get into the westbound lane. Um, if the cars were parked in the garage, it would still be the same problem. They would still be backing out. As my understanding is when I was there, and I think from the pictures, uh, the cars that are parked there now do not stick out into the sidewalk so that you don't have to go out around into the street or anyway to get past the cars. But the, but the, 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 the problem is that they have to back out. And if this is not, if this proposal is not uh, accepted, then that remains the same. The parking as proposed, if the proposal is accepted, means that the cars would par be parked in four spaces in the back. They would, when they come out, they would come out facing the street, facing the sidewalk, and therefore would see easily any children or runners or anything plus traffic uh, going by. Um, to me, there, there's no question that this is, parking-wise, this is a vast improvement uh, to what is there now. Because if we don't approve this, the parking remains the same. It is more dangerous than, than what would have happened under the approval. Now, to what Mr. Max, Maxwell was talking about, I have here uh, Mr. Cobb's letter from I think uh, December, um, in which he says uh, the number of violations, and I quote, the number of violations this rental property has accrued in just a few years is well documented in the property records. records. Adding another rental to this mix does not seem suitable or wise. So I, along with Mr. Maxfield said, okay, where are these records? what has been uh, levied against this property in the last few years uh, and how long is have these people now owned this property and what are the uh, violations that have been reported and recorded during their uh, ownership of this property? Maureen, we can get that information and distribute it to the board members probably tomorrow or the next day, right? Sure, and yeah. Certainly um, in a day or I two. Can, I, could, I, I could look it up right now, actually, if you want. But yeah, I, I can provide that for, uh, in preparation of the next meeting, if you wish. Please do, and, and, and the rental um, yep. permit as well. I, I think the strongest case, in looking through this, I, I the strongest case for this is that it increased safety on the sidewalk, because I think that Parking in the in the back is a far safer thing. I'm also concerned, though, is that um, the current and while it wouldn't it wouldn't increase uh, safety a, a lot, but the current rental requirement having and I think I'm right having to to uh, park in the garage isn't being obeyed. Um, the landlord could have, under the current situation, used the driveway that's there and had parking behind the the garage and, and could have solved that problem right now and hasn't done that. So in, in ways, the, the current situation is a result of the land, the current owner the, of the property allowing to um, park on the out in front of the garage and not even uh, not even comply with the current rental permit. And Mr. Langsdale, I went, when I went past there today just to look or the other day just to look at this, 
it really depends on the size of the car and the accuracy of the of the part of the uh, parker whether the whether the sidewalk is blocked or not if it's an, a large car and they give themselves a lot of room it that it's more than the bumper that's into the into the um, sidewalk so we do have it is a it's a bad situation um, as it's currently as it currently um, exists okay parking. thanks mr judge yep. the other stuff that's that i what i'm more concerned with i'm really concerned also with what it does to the neighborhood and i i'm i'm a big fan of infill i think it makes a lot of sense um, i think it makes a lot of sense especially in the in a denser downtown area i'm not sure that it makes sense here i'm not i just that's what I struggle with more than anything else is the additional um, people living in a, th that small space when you don't have that in the rest of the, of the neighborhood. The concern that the neighbors that, well, we're just gonna see all sorts of garages and other, and other dwelling units converted. I don't know that that's real because there's not a lot of extra dwelling, not a lot of units out there or structures out there that existed before the uh, zoning the bylaws were passed and that are available for this kind of conversion. I just, I don't know if that's true or not, but I do know that when you increase the amount of, of um, students and pressure in the area and, and if, whether it's, we can limit it to students is a question. We increase the amount of pressure in the area and the density and it does start to change the neighborhood in ways that um, may not be, um, it's not good for the neighborhoods. So I, that's the question I have. The struggle I have is between those two points, and I and I'm just not ready to make a, make a call on it yet. The last concern I have is about the drainage. I'm I'm I just don't believe. I, I just would want to see more that that um, that drainage is going to benefit. I just I look at that land. I see the slope. I see a gravel, an abandoned gravel driveway, and I say. That isn't the, that isn't within two percentage points of brand new asphalt. <laughs> There's more more soak the, the ground soaks up more than that and maybe that's just that's all experiential as opposed to um, um, a good analysis technical analysis. But it just it, I have a hard time believing that that is almost the identical um, what you see there today is almost identical to to, to new asphalt. And so I, I worry that we don't have enough in the terms of, of of, um, of drainage and the, the impact that has on the neighbors is a concern to me. So that's where I'm coming from if, if amongst the, um, our board members. I just wanted to share that. I haven't made my decision yet, but those are, those are what I'm concerned about. And the last thing is, I think it'd be great if there were families in there. That, makes, that, that does um, appeal to me, but I don't know that that can be enforced or that we can rely upon that. Uh, Ms. Parks. Ms. Parks. Um, I was going to say, I'm also concerned about it, that impervious surface because all of the pictures that we've looked at, there is grass growing there. And so there's a big difference to me between grass and asphalt. And I do see that there's a couple of stones here and there at the beginning and in, at the end of the driveway. And I do believe that, that, that cars have driven over that. But I do think there's that uh, it stands out to me that that's a lot of pavement going over grass. Um, in the backyard. Um, uh, the other thing that concerns me is two dwellings on one lot. I don't think that's a normal situation for Amherst to allow two separate dwelling units on one building lot. But I do get Dylan's point that it's existing. And so you have to deal with what's existing. And the other thing that stands out for me is the parking issue is an issue today. It's mm -hmm. and if, if that parking lot were put in and the garage were left as it is, that would take care of a lot of problems with this property. So putting a dwelling in the garage does not solve the parking problem. Putting a parking lot in the back solves the parking problem. I know that the owner does not have an incentive to put parking in the back unless there's a dwelling unit, but I see them as two separate issues. Like, you know, I. I, we shouldn't have to agree to allow the dwelling in order to handle a parking problem that is existing now. It'd be nice if that were just taken care of. Right. Um, so that's on my mind is that I understand that it's an improvement in safety, but that's, uh, that's not because there's not a dwelling unit there. And, and if I may make, um, comment on your, your comment, 
it's almost as if this could be, it could be handled without, um, on the landowner could handle this on his own. You could put that, that uh, park, the parking behind the, the garage, the existing garage now, regardless of whether we, whether we uh, approve the special permit or not and solve the problem. And, the, or the, I don't know if the town could require that, but that would be, that would solve the safety problem for the, that I see on that street. One other thing, Ms. I, uh, Parks. One other yep, thing I forgot to say is that we are, I, I hear the neighbors and I hear the concern and I, you know, that, that has an impact on, on, for me, when, you know, when neighbors talk about how, you know, how they feel that this is not an improvement to the neighborhood for them, it's a detriment. And so I do, I do hear that. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to say that. Um, and on a whole another subject, I am frustrated that we keep getting paperwork at the last minute and I do work full time. And so I can't always, if, if paperwork is sent to us in the morning, I can't necessarily see it until 4.30. And so I do feel like I don't have enough time to review all of the information. And like Mr. Sparkle's presentation or uh, response to Tom Reedy's letter is really useful. But, you know, when we don't get it until we're actually at mm -hmm. the meeting, it's, it's, it's harder for me to kind of put everything together in, into a, con, a cohesive idea. So I just, I, I second uh, Keith Langsdale's concern about having paperwork in a timely fashion, because every time we've said that, it still hasn't happened. So, um, you know, and I know there's a lot of factors that weigh into that, but maybe, maybe the thing to do is to have a hard deadline and just say, you know, three days before we just don't look at it. You know, it, you know that, that's a really good point. I mean, that's what we tried to do with this, the last, the bylaw change is to have seven days and then have, um, uh, if it wasn't, have some flexibility that we could judge and we just, and what we found is that it didn't work very well. And I think we just need to put everybody on notice that you got to get stuff in seven days before. That's just the that's just hard and fast rule. Now there's going to be min, de minimis changes and de minimis things that have that, that come up in the seven days. And we have to make a, we'll have to make a judgment about that, or the chair will have to make a judgment about that. But I just think we have to have a hard and fast rule on seven days because we do have people that work. We have people, we just can't, and and um, and I think that the, the in this case the two respondents were were um, tried to get something in early, but they didn't meet the seven days. But I think we just have to put everybody on notice, Mr. Reedy, Mr. Sparkle, for the next meeting and for all meetings in the front in the future. We need seven days ahead of time of the information to come in because I think most many of the people on this board work. I'm lucky I don't. Um, any have to anymore, but you can't get this done in 24 hours. And I, but I don't, I also think that it's going to be difficult for the staff to get all the, the um, project reports done seven days ahead of time because they have to respond to what they see. So we're not going to get the project application report until a couple days, of, I think a couple days before the, the meeting because you have to factor in the, the other. Um, material coming in. So that, that will continue to be something that will probably have to be looked at on a, you know, on a, on a Monday for a Thursday, for a Thursday meeting or a Tuesday on a Thursday meeting. And I, I, is that going to be acceptable to board members to have that as the one thing that comes late or not? Or do we have to move 14 days back and then have the project report seven days ahead of time? No, I, for me, I think what you're saying about the Monday uh, is is quite good. Uh, and I know that, you know, Maureen gets information sent to her. She has to process it and then get yeah. it out to us. So that if, if, the, if the material comes in seven days before, and then three or four days later, Maureen is able then to get it out to us, that should be fine. I mean, but yeah, so it's just, it, it's just this last minute. It's, it's too much. So, um, and the pay grade isn't great enough, you know. So, uh, uh, yeah, that would be good with me, certainly. All right. Well, we. I think the important thing is to put everybody on notice is that seven days is now hard and fast, and we really do we really do intend to enforce that. One, two. Um, we will try to get that 
the goal is to get that project application report out as quickly as possible, Maureen. And you tell us if that's not going to be possible on Monday. If that's, then maybe we have to move, maybe we have to move the date, not seven days, but we have to consider changing our rules to have it nine days ahead of time. But you need to, you need to tell us what, how much time you need to, to prepare the project application report reasonably, reasonable amount of time. And that, and maybe you can't do that right now, but that's what we have to, that's the piece of information we really have to have, you know, four days, three days ahead of time. And you can't do it when you're getting stuff at the last minute. So you let us know how much time you need for this, okay? okay. And we'll base the requirement on that. Okay. All right. So um, we're just about at nine o'clock. Does anybody else have, con oh, Ms. Pollock? Uh, Mr. Chair, so I've been sort of, uh, you know, I've been keeping notes of this meeting. Um, I, I've jotted down a list of things that the board would like uh, in preparation of the next meeting. Um, well, so, um, you know, you individually will uh, review Mr. Uh, Attorney Reedy's memo. Um, I will provide uh, you all a copy of Mr. Sparkle's PowerPoint presentation from tonight. Um, about um, items for uh, the applicant to perhaps consider um, submitting is uh, about the, the, the change of t uh, amount of tenants, uh, the prohibition of student rental in the converted dwelling, gatherings and overnight guests. Um, you know, you, you, you may want to consider updating the lease to reflect those proposals that you have. Um, I believe the chair asked for more information about the stormwater design and calculations and um, a little more clarity about the law coverage. Um, update the site plan to show the, um, if, you, uh, if you decide to extend the fence to show that, that length of extension and um, update the fence detail um, that would remove the sort of the gaps um, penetrating at the top. Um, and I will um, provide uh, the board a copy of the rental permit, parking plan, the existing uh, uh, rental permit and parking plan and, and to see if there's any violations on record. I believe there aren't any violations on record, but I will certainly just uh, look into that. I think that was it for... Okay. Um, Mr. Meadows. One other question for Mr. Moore. Um, can the town put up no parking signs along that road? I'll let Mr. Moore answer that. That might be a fire. That, yeah, that, I mean, that's a, um, generally it, it's a recommendation that might start with either public works or the police department, but the decision is ultimately made by the town council on whether or not there's a no parking uh, zone. <laughs> You know, the board could certainly be creative if they don't want parking in the front of the converted of the of the garage with boulders or or something that would sort of block a car. We, yeah. we could create a condition there. that there would be that would be make it impossible to park in front of the, the, the garage. But you still have the you still have the case of parking to the left of the driveway, so. That's the, you can make it all impossible, I guess, with a lot of boulders or fences or something. We have to be creative. All right, um, are there other questions, comments, suggestions? Then when's our next meeting, Maureen? Uh, let me check my calendar. I, I believe it's February 11th. February 11th, all right, so Right, as of tonight, the um, requirement is for seven days ahead of time for any, any new um, material. Maureen, if you find that that's not, if we, that doesn't give you enough time, inform the applicant and um, Mr. Reedy of the, the date you need to get material ahead of time, okay? So sure, okay, but, but, uh, but it would be safe to say, you know, so next week would be the 4th and 11th. Uh, you know, if um, Bucky, it sounds like if I'm getting any submissions, it would be via 
uh, Bucky Sparkle. So if I could get submissions by the third, that would be great. Okay. February 3rd. Okay. Is that All right. Wednesday? Uh, Wednesday. Yep. Wednesday. So but sooner, sooner is always better. Sooner is always better. But I'll, I'll type in, in my outlook to bother you on February 3rd. All right. So the submissions on the third for this meeting. Is there other items on the agenda for that? Meeting? There is. There is um, another special permit application uh, for 34 Baker Street. It's a continued public hearing. And I want to say there might be one public meeting that is a sort of minimal, uh, a minor request, but I can't exactly think of the item. And also, I, I might be making that up. But uh, 34 Baker Street is on the agenda. <laughs> All right. So we are going to. I is there a motion to continue this matter until the 11th of Fe February at six o'clock? And um, I um, about that. Um, so the 34 B Baker Street public hearing um, was continued from the December 10th meeting. And if you bear with me, unfortunately, for a few moments, uh, I, I believe we continued it to 630. So, and that might have been one of the last 630 ZBA meetings that we have. Um, so, uh, we could start if if it's um, okay with you know uh, attorney bard and and mr mora we could open this public hearing at 6 and then open the mm -hmm. baker street at 6:30 if if that's okay fine fine with me okay that works okay so we'll do 6 o'clock if everyone's kosher with that all right Six o'clock, and then we'll move to Baker Street at six thirty, and we'll go back to this. It's at, um, exactly. All right, that works fine. Okay, and then the other, the last thing is, do people want to have uh, an administrative meeting to discuss the um, to discuss submission requirements, or have we solved that problem for now? Submission requirements. Well, the, the due date seven. We I had originally at the beginning of this talked about having a, this discussed at an administrative meeting. Um, and if we need to have an administrative meeting to discuss it, that we could do it at the end of that, uh, or at the 11th. If not, if we don't need to do it and we've solved the problem, we can move on. I think, I think we've solved the problem, but um, I don't know if other members want to speak. Mr. Langsdale, you raised it first. Uh, I, I think we've talked about it and I think we can go forward. I'm fine. Good. All right. So we have those two meetings, two, two matters to meet on the 11th. All right, so I'll, Mr. Maxfield has moved to continue this meeting to the 11th at six o'clock. Is there a second? Second. Just a roll call vote. Um, so we have Mr. Langsdale. Aye. Uh, chair votes aye, Mr. Langsdale votes aye. Aye. Mr. Mr. Park, Ms. Parks. Aye. Mr. Maxfield. Aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. The meeting is um, continued until um, the 11th at six o'clock. Public hearing is continued. Excuse me, You're right. thank you. The public hearing is continued to six o'clock. Uh, the next order of business is any public comments on matters not before the board tonight. Any attendees have a comment? We have no no comments and no matters that were not anticipated before 48 hours before the meeting. I think we're done with the with the um, the public hearing. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? Second. This there's no discussion and this is a roll call vote. I vote aye. Mr. Langsdale. Aye. Ms. Parks. Aye. Mr. Maxfield. Aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. 
we are adjourned. Thank you. Good Thank night. you, everybody. Thank Good you. night, everyone. Good night.